We still have an hour according to the talk. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Happy Pi Day. I'd like to call to order. Oh, do we have some feedback? I'd like to call to order the, the March 14th meeting of the Electoral, Electoral Area Services Committee. I want to acknowledge that we are meeting on the unceded and traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, keepers of this land. We do have a few people in the gallery, so I'll just note the emergency exits are to the left and through the door that you came in. The muster uh, position is in the parking lot. The bathrooms are down the hallway and behind this room. Uh, moving along in the agenda, we have a management report for receipt. Moved and seconded. And are there any comments or questions on the management report? No, nope. hearing and seeing none. All in favor of receipt? Opposed? And that's carried. We have advisory planning commission minutes for receipt. Moved and seconded for both the uh, Agricultural Advisory Planning Commission and the Area A APC. Were there any comments on those minutes? Hearing and seeing none. All in favor of approval of both? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Item number two, Electoral Area C, a development, development variance permit for form and character for 8958 Clarkson Avenue for receipt. Moved and seconded, and I'll move it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Dylan Deason, Planner, is here to introduce this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, welcome, Dylan. Oops, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Russell. Through the Chair to the Directors, a form and character development permit and a development variance permit have been received to facilitate the development of a tourist accommodation facility on the property at 8958 Clarkson Avenue. In terms of the overall development, the applicant is seeking to redevelop the property with 15 indoor tourist accommodation units, one residential unit for a caretaker, six RV, RV pad rental sites, and a pavilion and swimming pool for guests. Beginning with the variance application, the applicant is seeking to reduce the two side yard setbacks by 1.3 meters to accommodate an external staircase. You'll note that the northern lot line has a larger setback, which is because it is adjacent to a roadway, but that the encroachment is the same, leaving a 3.2 meter setback for the northern lot line and a 2.2 meter setback for the southern lot line. They are also seeking to increase the maximum height of the structure for the portion that is within seven and a half meters of the lot line from eight to 10 meters to accommodate the portions of the roof line that encroach beyond the eight meter height limit. The Advisory Planning Commission for Area C voted to support the variances, noting that the proposed variances are minor encroachments that generally still meet the intent of the zoning requirements and that professional services have been engaged in the planning and design of the proposed variances. Staff sent mail notification packages to tenants and property owners within a 50 meter radius of the subject property and heard back from four neighboring properties, two of whom were opposed to the variances and two of whom were supportive. Staff are recommending that the variances be approved as the height increase is only to accommodate a small portion of the proposed structure's roof lines as evidenced in the figures included in the staff report. And because the foundation of the structures still meet the lot line setbacks, so there are no privacy or maintenance concerns. Additionally, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure has given their approval for the variance that is subject to the higher road setback, which is required to go through the provincial ministry whenever a portion of a structure encroaches within four and a half meters of a road right of way. For the development permit, the tourist accommodation units and caretaker units will be housed in four structures, each of which housing themselves four units. The structures are built up to meet the necessary flood construction level, leaving parking space on the ground. Each structure will have six parking stalls in addition to two stalls off the driveway entrance and parking associated with the RV pads. 
staff are aware that street parking is a very important topic for the neighborhood and note that there are no provisions associated with this application for street parking and no changes to the size of Iron Road, which is an important beach access. A landscaping plan was provided by Mystic Woods Landscape Design, which provides for the treatment of most open spaces on the property. This includes the restoration of the 15 meter open space along the waterfront, which was done in concert with the biologist and in preparation for an aquatic and riparian habitat development permit, as well as screening and buffering between roadways and neighboring properties. Lastly, a rainwater management plan was prepared by a professional engineer to ensure that drainage requirements for the proposed redevelopment are met and there's no result in any increase in rainwater runoff. The Advisory Planning Commission for Area C also voted to support the development permit, noting that the planned development is, consist is consistent with the expectations of the lots zoning. Staff are recommending that the development permit be approved as it meets all technical requirements as outlined in Section 85 of the Official Community Plan, and it meets all zoning requirements as outlined in Section 903 of the Zoning Bylaw. I'll note that the applicant, uh, Kyle O'Shea, is on the Zoom call, and I'm available to answer any of your questions. Great. Thank you. And Kyle, uh, did you have any uh, um, additions to the presentation that was made by Dylan? Uh, no, no. Uh, thanks, Dylan, for the presentation. Uh, I feel like he touched on everything, um, you know, uh, about the you know, overall scope of what we're trying to achieve here. So um, I'm happy to help um, answer any additional questions that the uh, committee might have. Um, but yeah, I think he pretty much covered it. Thank you. We do have a question from Director Greaves, so if you can hold on. Yeah, for sure. Thanks very much, Madam Chair, and through the chair to staff. Um, being that this is basically um, our zone TC1, um, and we're just looking for a couple of three, uh, one height uh, over height, and then a couple of variances on the on the setbacks. Is this the only time that this project is going to come before us? Um, is this directed to me? No. I'm happy to take the lead on that, Kyle. Thanks. Yeah. Um, to Director Grief, through the chair to Director Grief, uh, the directors would only receive this application if the owner or applicant propose any substantial changes that would substantiate a further review by the directors. Okay, now I noticed that it is for tourist accommodation. Um, in the past on this property, we had basically what was a strata masquerading as tourist accommodation, how is that going to change? Yeah, I'm not too sure if staff can comment much on the ownership of the uh, proposed development beyond uh, reminding directors and the applicant that it is zoned tourist commercial, so they are intended for the traveling public not to be rented out, not to be privately owned, and anything to do with residential occupancy that may be in contravention would be dealt with by our bylaw enforcement uh, department. Okay, well, that's a big question in the community, of course. Um, as with all campsites, uh, they become permanent residents. So I'm just, uh, that was one thing, and uh, we can't comment on that, that's fine. But the other thing was brought up at the APC meeting was the fact that if we're going to be um, redeveloping the Clarkson Road area, because anybody who's driven down there knows that it, it looks a lot like a, you know, a 1950s style auto court. All that's missing is the uh, teal blue Chevrolet Impella in the driveway. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, is, is there any... Uh, is there any possibility of, uh, of having some kind of uh, public consultation on there, like an open house? Because if we're going to be redeveloping Clarkson Drive, um, there's a lot of people think this is extremely ugly. It would never pass the uh, Tom Dishlevoy or, or Paul Kime test for architecture. But, you know, I heard the, the, uh, the argument that it's because of our regulations being with a floodplain that they have to build it like that. But it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be as very aesthetically pleasing 
um, to people in the greater community. So I'm just wondering, I guess we have no purview over, over uh, you talk about, you know, form and character is not form and character. We're just talking about, you know, basically setbacks, which are, you know, a survey issue. So um, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I don't think that the public is going to embrace this. Um, I'm concerned about the, uh, you know, it actually being used for the traveling public. So um, I'm not sure I'm going to support this. And I would invite uh, Kevin Brooks to uh, chime in if he has anything to say. Does the uh, applicant have any comments about uh, um, any uh, things that you'll have in place to prevent long-term um, rental of, of the units? Um, Madam Chair. Um, oh, sure, sorry. And I'll, I'll go to Ton first, sorry. Okay. Through, through the CEO to the chair, to director brief, um, just to confirm, um, Kevin Brooks is not the agent for this, um, for this applicant. Um, I think he, um, their agent is on the line right now, and, well, and he can speak to. I thought I'm just going off the name on on Zoom. Great, and I think it's Kyle. If if I Kyle O'Shea, yeah. Yes, um, yeah. So um, I'm the applicant of record, so yeah, I, I help put together essentially the drawings uh, for the permit package. So, um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So the comment was on, um, you know, ensuring I guess past history of the site. Uh, has meant that possibly that there were long-term rentals versus, versus tourist rentals. Um, do you are you aware of anything in place to kind of prevent um, prevent this kind of creeping into that long-term rental? Um, I know this is brought up at the advisory panel um, commission as well, and I, I believe the owner Don has spoken to it uh, mm -hmm. that you know I, I don't know about extra measures put in place, but uh, the intent is obviously to. Um, you know, adhere to all the bylaws and regulations of the zoning and everything. And the intent is, is my understanding is to have it be a tourist accommodation. Um, and that's the information I've been given to date. So that's all I can really speak to. But uh, yeah, I'm quite confident that that's the intent for this um, development here. So um, yeah, that's all I can really speak at this time to that. I'm not sure if there's additional documentation required. We'd be happy to provide if, if that's the case, but uh, you know, our intent is to adhere to all the applicable, essentially, regulations of bylaws. Sure, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. I had a couple of questions, one for staff, or but I see that, uh, Dylan, did you want to make a comment? Okay. Um, seeing that, you know, one of the variances that's been applied for is height. Um, I first of all want to congratulate, you know, the applicant for the design that takes into account flooding. Um, you know, we know that this area is, in that um, zone that has been identified as potential flood risk. And seeing as the, the design includes, um, you know, the, the buildings on pylons, which probably contributed to the extra height. I'm wondering if staff would like to comment on whether or not our own bylaws may need to be adjusted. If future, if we see a number of future designs that have this above ground, like have a parking and then um, above, so. Thank you very much, Director Kamir. Uh, through the chair to the directors, I uh, certainly appreciate your comments on this application. That is something that staff can consider. Um, we do have provisions within the official community plan to reduce setbacks or increase height by a relatively marginal amount through a development permit. We tend to not to do that for the form and character development permits because they're intended to be used with environmentally sensitive permits if it'll help an applicant move further away from an eagle nest or a water course or something like that. But given the form and character, perhaps there's an avenue for exploration, particularly when it comes to flood construction level. Um, that language already is in the official community plan, so we can increase the height by up to 10% through a development permit, which I don't think would have been enough in this case anyways, but something staff can certainly explore. Um, just to quickly touch on Director Greed's comments, if I may, form and character certainly is a subjective measure and it's a very difficult thing to measure. Staff definitely appreciate and understand the concerns of the neighborhood and the history of the property and many properties like this. There are a lot of tourist commercial properties in the area that may or may not be um, used appropriately, but have been there for a very long time. Uh, the 
applicant, as is probably obvious, is planning on removing all existing structures. There are some structures that encroach over that IRA road um, lot line right now, so those will be removed and the setbacks will be protected, which ideally should help the public with parking and beach access. And then the raising of the structures, again, it does allow for protection by meeting the flood construction level to the year 2100, and it allows for more space to be provided on the property for parking, which will hopefully alleviate the parking concerns that many residents have raised. Thank you. And Tom, you have a comment? Thanks, Madam Chair. Just one more question uh, through uh, the chair, CEO, or the staff. Um, my understanding is the septic system will be a pump system. Is that correct? There's no field on site. Uh, I would actually have to ask the applicant to comment on specific septic design. Okay. How Does the applicant know? How would you be able to comment on, on um, how the septic system and, and how it's being powered? It's a little bit outside of my particular uh, area of expertise. I, I could bring up the report um, done by the engineers. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it, did you hear that? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, guys, thank you very much. I'm Don Cameron. I'm actually the property owner, and I can certainly touch on a couple of those items. Yeah, the septic system is is a is a uh, what's there right now is actually quite a new system. It was a, a complicated what they refer to as a type two system. Uh, so it's made up of a of a a bunch of different pumping units. But uh, we plan to use um, the existing. Um, system uh, with some minor modifications just because the design of the overall topography is changing. Uh, but the system that's there right now is, was built two years ago and is sufficient for this development, um, unless anybody else has any other questions. Great, thank you. I think there's still some more questions. Um, while I have either you or, or Kyle on the, on the Zoom, um, the, the issue of parking has been brought up by um, members of the public and by area C director. I just wanted to confirm um, the, the units that have the four uh, units per building, are there four parking spots underneath? Um, is there enough parking for each of the units? You go ahead, Kyle. Oh yeah, um, yes, there is sufficient parking. Um, I'm just looking at the plans here just so I make sure I got everything. Right. Uh, we included a parking plan in the submission, which indicates that uh, there are three parking spots for each. Well, I guess there'd be one, two, three, four, five, six parking spots for each of the cabins, as you see there. Um, I guess on the plan that's uh, visible right now, it kind of you kind of see that there's four stalls essentially, but the the two stalls towards the um, inside of each of the cabins actually is uh, deep enough to accommodate two cars. So obviously those would be, um, you know, parking for people using one of the residences. So there's no, you know, chance of someone being double parked and kind of a blocked in. But uh, the intent was to try to maximize parking for the occupants um, of these buildings, you know, as much as the site would allow. So yeah, it is our understanding that uh, adequate parking has been provided. Okay, and I think a staff comment. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to answer your question in regards to the height and if this is something that staff would like to look at, um, later on today, um, there is a staff report that's coming to this committee in regards to their um, to the coastal floodplain adaptations um, phase two component. Um, through their studies and invention, when we when the report is complete, you know that's a discussion that staff can look at to see if something that we can look into uh, reviewing the, the height of, of the buildings due to floodplain issues. Thank you. Director Arbor, did I see your light on? No? Uh, Director Grieve, did you have anything further? Just for, the, just for the record, um, yeah, I think that um, I'm not sure that the design of this actually fits with the long-term goal of, uh, of turning the uh, the foreshore into a more modern and more appealing um, tourist accommodation area. But I understand the fact that it's because of our own regulations that it has to be thus. Um, 
so some of the some of the concerns have been answered. Um, I still think the parking is probably not inadequate because you're pretty well going to have to park on the street if you're a visitor. Um, I am concerned that um, that the uh, the group that owns it, uh, you know, will become kind of more of a, a private cottage getaway than something available to the traveling public. And I know we've uh, we have bylaws around that, but they've been loosely enforced. So yeah, I, I have apprehension. I think the, the community is concerned because this is the first major redevelopment of that, that strip and it kind of sets the tone. But um, you know, things are what they are, what they are. So, um, so uh, being that we're only dealing with the three items here, um, that I'll concentrate on, on, the, uh, on the setbacks and the height variance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions from the um, the directors, so I'll quote unquote excuse the uh, applicants from the table. Um, I believe we have some items to receive uh, in terms of communications from the 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 neighbors. Um, oh, we'll vote on receipt, I guess. Sorry. So uh, on receipt of the uh, application, uh, all in favor of receipt. Opposed. And that's carried unanimously. And the correspondence has been moved Second. and seconded. And are there any comments on the correspondence? No, no. Not yet. Uh, so on uh, receipt of the correspondence, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And I should ask, is there anyone in the room that would like to speak to this um, item? We don't see any others, not seeing any, then there's no addendums. So then we'll move forward on the recommendation. So we have recommendation one regarding the, uh, the setbacks. I can move that. Is there a second? Also. Seconded by Director Brief. Comments on the recommendation? And this is to reduce the side yard setbacks and to increase the maximum height. Uh, Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, <clears throat> when I was looking at the correspondence, there was a couple of comments in one of the letters that there seems to be plenty of land to make things work uh, without seeking variances. And I'm also concerned, especially on the north line, that the building granting the variance by an extra two meters and right next to the right, the beach access, I think that's gonna look really overbearing on the beach access. So I'm, I'm leaning on, on not supporting this, thanks. Are there any other comments or, uh, sorry, Dylan? Um, yeah, if I may, uh, through the chair to the directors, um, just a reminder certainly that you can um, put forth a motion to amend the motion if you wanted to vote on these items individually um, and consider the setbacks or the height individually, but it, of course, whatever the directors feel is most appropriate. Okay, thank you. And Director Green. So basically we're arguing around three feet, right? A little over three feet. So I don't think it's gonna shake the world. Thanks. Thanks for that comment. Okay, so we do have a motion on the table to move all of the um, setbacks and the height um, uh, increase. Um, so I'll call the question on that motion. All in favor? Opposed? There's one, Dr. Arbor's opposed, so that carries. And then we have recommendation two. Moved, and I can second, and that's that the CVRD um, form and ca character development permit for the development related and site works on the property described. Um, what's the motion there? As part of the, the all right, as, as presented, I guess, on the screen, uh, and it's been moved and seconded. Any comments on that motion? So we're approving the, the form and character development permit. Yeah, uh, Dr. Grieve. 
maybe we should change the term form and character <laughs> because we have no input into the character part of it. And it would be nice in future just so we can get some more aesthetically pleasing development in that area because it, it is the beginning of, of the new era. Thank you. Comment, I see that uh, staff are noting that. And I don't see any other lights on. So on, uh, on that recommendation, all in favor? Opposed? One opposed, Director Arbor, and that's carried. All right, Mo I'm not sure. Moving on, uh, item number three, electoral area B, commercial and industrial form and character permit for 1239 Anderton Road for receipt. Second. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Brian Chow, Planner, is here to describe this report and answer any of your questions. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead. Good morning. Uh, through the CEO to the Chair to committee members, this item on the agenda is for a commercial form and character development permit for the property at one, two, three, nine, Anderton Road. It is uh, commonly known as the park at Crown Now, and the size of the property is approximately 21.4 hectares in area. It's currently zone rural recreation one. Right now, the subject property has a golf course, a clubhouse with a restaurant and maintenance shops. The applicant proposes a new campground with 13 sites, a utility building featuring a combined washroom and electrical room, and a caretaker's residence. Any new building within a commercially zoned property such as this one would require a commercial and industrial farming character development permit. And so that's the purpose of today's application. According to the RGS and the OCP, the Regional Growth Strategy and Official Committee Plan, this property is designated within settlement expansion areas. And the OCP contains development permits area guidelines of which I will um, highlight and summarize for you. The proposed campground is assessed from an existing driveway for the golf course. There's a proposed single entrance and exit point of the campground located east of the existing clubhouse. An emergency gated exit is proposed at the eastern end of the campground. In support of the proposed camp use, campground use, a utility building located between campsites five and six is proposed. The size is approximately 18 square meters in area and one story high and the roof will be metal and siding will be hardy plank. In addition, there's a caretaker's residence of approximately 53 square meters in area proposed uh, and is located next to the maintenance shops um, behind uh, current landscaping. With respect to landscaping, it's the intent of the applicant to keep, to retain the forest setting as much as possible, but only clearing enough to accommodate the campsites, the combined building infrastructure. As I mentioned earlier, the proposed caretaker's residence is located in, in an existing clearing next to maintenance shops. And this is what I would call a backstage area because it's now it's exist, a shield by existing trees and vegetation to provide visual screening from guests and neighbors. The removal, monitoring and retention of existing vegetation and trees will be guided by a professional prepare report. And the professional states that the applicant, confirms that the applicant intends to maximize the number of retained trees as part of this proposal. One of the guidelines is about screening. The guidelines state that there should be a, at least three meter buffer from residential lots. The proposal consists of the aforementioned minimum three meter buffer along the southern lot lines where it interface with the residential lot, which is 2509 William Place and William Place itself, which is a public road. In addition, the applicant proposes a 1.8 meter high wrought iron fence along these lot lines. In terms of parking, um, there are parking spots 
uh, at each individual campsites. Plus, there'll be 16 additional parking spaces for the guests um, spread out over three areas. With respect to rainwater management, the applicant provided a professionally prepared rainwater management plan from a professional engineering firm. And this plan has been revised based on DP area guidelines, Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure's requirement for drainage, and in response to Town of Comox comments. CVRD engineering services staff reviewed these reports and deemed that the proposed rainwater management plan meets the development permit area guidelines. It demonstrates that the proposed development strives to maintain pre-development flow patterns and volumes over the entire water season. We do recognize the valuable comments provided by Town Comox on the rainwater management aspects of this proposal. Unlike member municipalities, the CVRD does not have a storm sewer service to manage drainage. As such, the on-site rainwater management plan is the only tool at this time to manage rainwater within the scope of the project. On May 18th of last year, 2021, I just want to add that the City of Courtney Develop Director of Development Services replied that they have no concerns with this proposal. This, pro this proposal meets the zoning bylaw regulations and um, the Advisory Planning Commission for Electoral Area B met on April 28th, 2021, and they supported the proposal because the development matched the zoning bylaw requirements. It would not increase traffic on Anderton Road, and the proposed design fits with the neighborhood and adds to the golf course. A couple more comments. Um, their uh, agent is online. His name is Rick Waldhouse. And I did receive some feedback about uh, water. I just want to say that this property is within the Comox Valley Water Local Service Area. And I confirm with manager of water services that there is enough water capacity to support the 13 proposed campsites, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks, Brian. Um, does the applicant have anything to add to the presentation? Uh, not at this time. I think Brian did a great job of explaining the project, um, but I am available for any questions that may come up. Thank great, you. thank you. And we have a question from Director Grieve. Thanks, Madam Chair, and through the Chair and the CAO. Um, to the applicant, I guess, um, I know when this project, or not, not this project, but a similar project was uh, proposed in 2009, um, the biologists that did the study uh, found coho fry in the um, in in the creeks and, and the tributaries. Some of them are seasonal. Uh, they managed to get out of the seasonal ones before they dry up in the summer. I'm just wondering, uh, are those coho fry still uh, in in the uh, watershed, or are they long gone? Uh, not not sure to be honest. Um, this area here is away from the area where the creeks are, uh, but nothing at this point is is. is uh, um, affecting or disturbing the, the creeks on the, on the property. Okay, and, and uh, a lot of our discussion today with the, the different proposals coming forward is uh, regarding um, on-site septic or potential uh, sewer hookup. And uh, I guess, you know, being that you're probably within spitting distance of a sewer main, um, you're putting in a system now that may be redundant in 10 years. If uh, should we ever get uh, extension of sewer beyond the uh, boundaries of the municipalities or should the municipalities um, ever decide to annex? Um, so I'm just, just making sure that the proponent understands that uh, times are changing. And much with the, the previous uh, application here, um, there is probably a chance that uh, there will be some sewer services becoming available. And I'm always concerned that all these proposals uh, are, are not actually furthering the discussion around a publicly funded system. Just, uh, you know, it seems to me that the, um, this area traditionally, uh, the development has been more along the lines of, uh, of, you know, hire security guards, clear cut the place, take off the topsoil and uh, apply for annexation. And as a city of Courtney, 
which has happened in the past. But um, have you approached the city of Courtney about annexation of this property? Not at this point, no, we haven't. Okay, so there's a bit of a change in the uh, in the in the tide there. Then, okay, that's all my comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Director Grief. Director Arter. I think so. I wasn't planning to comment on this part, but since Director Grief brought it up, um, I'm unless I'm I'm politically blind, I'm I'm not aware of any efforts right now, but in municipalities to extend into the rural areas or extend services in the rural areas. Um, I know that in the RGS, most of area B is supposed to eventually fold into uh, the municipalities, but I, I'm not seeing any political movement or appetite to go that route. I think the municipalities with their excursion into uh, the South I've, I've, uh, I found out that it's very expensive <laughs> proposal to try to extend their boundaries. So, um, so I, I, anyways, in, in regards to this application, what I'm trying to say is it's going to be a moot point for me. It's not something that will uh, matter in this in this regard. Um, but this being said, I do have a question um, because we are getting, and and generally speaking, it's it, it's fine. Just just to say, I think I think staff and the applicant have done a decent job. But my only concern is, and we had it last month. There's a ton of campground <laughs> applications we're having right now, um, and that's good. I think we've noticed through COVID that there's huge demand for it. But we've also had concerns about um, you know campgrounds becoming almost like full time living, as Director Grieve uh, mentioned earlier. So can I get staff to just comment again? Our current, I think at the last application that came forward to us regarding RV sites and campground, it was mentioned that we only act on those activities when there's a complaint, right? But my question is, is it in the arsenal of regional districts? Because I saw, I see that with the Islands Trust, where in certain issues they take they don't go by complaint, they can actually go by proactive um, search. And the reason why I bring this up is, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that we're not, and I'm not saying this is the case with this application, but I want to put that risk, de-risk <laughs> uh, that, that, that potential, because we're seeing all these campground and RV applications everywhere. Is it in, in, our, in our purview if we wanted to move from a complaint system to verifying that, that those operations are actually indeed uh, working to purpose, um, is that something we could look at down the road or will it always be complaint driven? Thank you. Tom? Um, through Madam Chair to Director Arbor, that, that's a great question. Um, through their zone bylaw regulations, as you know, their um, tourist combinations allows you to, um, the purpose of that is for the traveling public. Um, we are currently right now um, enforcing by complaint basis. And this is how we're moving forward with it. Um, if there is a safe um, 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 life safety issues because to permanent structures, obviously the building inspectors will go on and, and, and view that. But regards to the RVs and the campsites, um, these RVs are not made for permanent residents. They're for seasonal um, accommodations and they're not built for permanent residents where someone can live there throughout the whole year. I guess I'll, I'll maybe further that question because um, uh, I think what Director Arbor is asking is, um, would our staff go out and do a, an inspection without a complaint? Is there is that a possibility? It's from my understanding, through Madam Chair, um, it's from my understanding that uh, we are driven through complaint um, basis. So um, staff would not just drive around um, to all the tourist commercials or to ensure that there is uh, no permanent opportunity. And it's hard for staff to um, um, understand when they arrive and when they left. So it's onus, it's onus to the owner of the property to comply to our regulations. The regulations are for a purpose. And I, Madam Chair, I would just add to that the complaint based system is the most common local governments implement so it's it's a standard that is set by others in the in the province so it's to be expected. It's also on the basis of providing the most defensible system. 
um, uh, complaint-based system is is uh, uh, admired by the courts in terms of uh, when it comes to to defending those actions that go that extra length and go that far. But certainly, it is a matter of policy that uh, the board could decide on a different form of system. But you would have to take a look at uh, the resources and implications of of taking such action. So it's it's not a decision I would take lightly. Of course, thank you, uh, Director Arger. Thanks. I think I, I got my answer from the CEO, which is it is possible. So that's the key. Uh, it, would it be easy? But it, I think we just realized that in the rural areas, it's basically a self-enforcement system with complaints. Um, in small rural communities, it takes it takes a lot. Things have to go pretty far, I think, for complaints to start emerging. A lot of the times, not always. But we don't have business licenses. Um, we see on a number of issues that we have a hard time um, regulating activities. Um, so I don't think we'll get business licenses from the province as, as, a, as a right, but it's good to know that if things, you know, if we approve 500 <laughs> RV and campsites over the next couple of years, because those applications keep coming, that if it runs away on us, that there are other avenues we could pursue to make sure that the activities comply. Thank you. Thanks, Director Arbor. Uh, Director Grief. Thanks, Madam Chair, to your CEO. I'm, I'm just going to reinforce what Director Arbor said because it's a real serious concern out there in the electoral areas that the campsites are filling up with the permanent residents. Um, to be fair, you know, we do need some affordable housing out there and uh, we just maybe look the other way a little bit because it, it we do care about our community, especially now, when uh, a $600,000 average home is ridiculous because you can't find one, and that's how we base our taxes. Um, I think that, um, you know, to be fair, that there should be some accommodation available for the traveling public when they're traveling. So maybe we could look into something more along the lines of, you know, short stays. I don't know how long you can stay in provincial campgrounds. I think it's only a couple of weeks. And forestry campgrounds, they, they actually come around in the middle of nowhere on Stella Lake. And, oh, you were here last week, you know? So, you know, it, it makes sense to offer something to the traveling public. So even if it's it's uh, one third of the accommodations or something like that. But this is a bigger question. Um, uh, fear not, uh, it, we're not going to come down on the Longlands Golf Course on this, but... Um, I think overall, we should be looking to somehow tweaking the regulations to, uh, like you say, to allow it to be used for the intended purpose, which is to accommodate the traveling public. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll just make a comment. Um, I know this is uh, area B area, and, and I've had some complaints from residents on Perry Place in the past around flooding coming off of this property. But I know that staff have confirmed that um, where these campsites are going um, closer to William Place, um, there doesn't seem to be quite as much um, interaction with uh, the creeks that are on, on the property. Um, and I'm just going to confirm we haven't received any other um, notices from, from the neighbors. Great. And Brian, did you have a comment? Yes. Uh, to CEO, to Madam Chair and uh, committee members, just two points of um, comments just to reiterate this proposal is beyond 30 meters of any known water courses so that's why there's no uh, reference to that because it's outside our aquatic development permit area and secondly just to confirm that in the rural recreation one zone of which this property is under the uh, maximum stay is 50 percent of the campsite is limited to a maximum stay of six months in a 12 month period. And the relocation of RVs within the same campground does not constitute the start of a new stay. So we do have a current zoning regulation to uh, apply the temporary accommodation or temporary stay for the traveling public, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Arvin. Yeah, thanks. And, um... Uh, hopefully it's an interesting conversation for the applicant too, because we're going a bit beyond, but the, uh, talking about the zoning and the bylaw, I think it, a bit like we saw with another application, I just want to be clear that the potential uh, the way our bylaw is written is that 
you know, we can have people living there for six months through the winter, snowbirds that come back to the region, and then the campsite can be used through uh, the summer for the traveling public. So just to know that the use can very much look year round if uh, if the, the business ownership was uh, intending to go that route. So um, yeah, so that's my only comment, thanks. Thanks. So I don't see, oh, Dr. B. In fairness to all horses, I'm not gonna flog them when they're deceased, but um, I think that, you know, we have a, a possibility of, uh, at least in area C of over 200 campsites coming forward in the next little while. So I would think that uh, perhaps um, whether or not we want to bring this up in our new business, but you know, it's a long, it's a long game, but I do think that we should perhaps have a look at our bylaw and comparatives to other, other areas, uh, especially the, the ones that have a lot of tourist accommodations like our friends in the South and parks and whatever. So I do think it needs a revamp. Things are changing. Uh, like I say, with the advent of over 200 new campsites possibly coming coming uh, online, um, it's a good thing, but it, it needs to be controlled. Thank you. Thanks. I don't see any other comments from the director, so I'll excuse the applicant from the table. On receipt of the report, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. The recommendation has been moved and seconded. And are there any comments on that? This is the approval of the 13 campsites and the utility building and the caretaker's residence on the property. Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item number four, an electoral area C, commercial and industrial form and character development for 8655 and 8655A Island Highway North. Yeah. On receipt, we've moved and seconded over to staff. Thank you very much. And uh, Brian Chow will introduce this report as well and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Brian. Through the CEO to the chair and commission members, we have another commercial and industrial farming character development permit for the properties at Island Highway North, as mentioned earlier. But in this case, um, well, first, firstly, uh, this application is for a lot line adjustment between two industrial lots that are adjacent to each other and no new lots uh, proposed as part of this lot line adjustment. So let's see. So the, the, as I mentioned earlier, there are two subject properties involved. There are 8659 Island Highway North, which I'll call the Northern Lot, and then 8655 and 8655A Island Highway North, which is the Southern North lot. Currently, the northern lot is vacant and the southern lot has an industrial building. And this industrial building was developed under approvals of a previous commercial and industrial farming character development permit uh, that was uh, applied in 2017 and under uh, approved building permit as listed in the staff report. The proposed lot line adjustment between two lots will yield a what's called proposed lot one to be approximately 0.28 hectares in size and proposed lot two to be approximately 0.44 hectares in area. As I mentioned before, this proposal will not involve any new lots, any new buildings or changes to existing buildings. This lot line adjustments triggers the requirement for a commercial and industrial farming character development permit as both lots are so industrial light and we deem lot line adjustment as a form of development. The properties are within the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Local Service Area. Currently, each of the two lots have an existing water connection. And I just want to confirm that with the proposed lot line adjustment, this will not change the allocation of the two existing connections and has no effect or not impacted by the current water connection suspension currently in effect. The regional growth strategy and official community plan designate the subject properties within settlement nodes. I will just highlight some of their forming character development area guidelines in this presentation. As I mentioned earlier, this proposal does not involve any changes to any existing buildings or involve any new buildings. The current industrial buildings that's already there will continue to operate 
and continue to be a uh, function and has the same format character as approved in 2017. Similarly, in terms of landscape plan, this lands the landscaping that was approved earlier was deemed to be completed by a landscape professional in October 2019, and landscaping will continue as is. If there's any new buildings or any new structures proposed, a new development permits would then be required, and then we will need a new landscape plan at a, a future time if this were ever to happen. I guess what's the most interesting aspect of this application is the rainwater management. Even though no new lots are proposed, the size of the lots will change. And so it's important to ensure that with the reduce or the changes in lot sizes that each proposed lot can handle rainwater on its own. So there is a professionally prepared rainwater management plan and engineer comment that with the proposed lot one being smaller, there will be less inflow from this lot to the existing rainwater management system. And they deem that the post-development flow is equal to the pre-development flow for both properties and no further action is required. CVRD engineer services staff review the rainwater management plan, have no concerns. This proposal meets all zoning regulations, including uh, the requirements for minimum lot area requirement, because there's a section in the zoning bylaw which accepts uh, a lot from meeting the minimum lot area if it's only a lot line adjustment. And this proposal meets all that. This proposal was presented to Electoral Area C Advisory Planning Commission uh, last Thursdays, last Thursday, oh, sorry, on February 10th, 2022. Sorry for that. As um, this, uh, they supported this proposal because development is minor in nature, the rainwater management has been addressed. And while there's some access uh, comments or concerns, uh, Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure will be the authority to address this matter in their uh, lot line adjustment review, Madam Chair. Oh, and I do have to say, the agent, Hal Martin, is online to answer any questions uh, the commission members, uh, committee members may have, Madam Chair. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Mr. Martin, uh, any comments that you'd like to add? Uh, I don't think so at this point. Uh, Brian's done a, a, an excellent job at presenting the, the situation. Um, we've got basically two related uh, ownership properties here. Um, and in looking at the development that has already happened on lot one and the potential for development on the uh, other lot, adjusting these lot lines makes it uh, much better, uh, provides more opportunity on proposed lot two uh to uh develop something in the future uh but at, the, at this point there is no change in the effective function of the of the property so i'll leave it at that if there's any questions i'm happy to answer great thank you do directors have any questions i don't see lights on director Green. thanks madam chair and through cao um yeah it, getting back to uh comments from the Area Planning Commission. Um, there was no, there was no surprises. Uh, they totally understood that you know sharing the uh, access to the road made a lot of sense, and it's uh, obviously in keeping with um, with the activities in that in that area. So um, no, I, I'm definitely in support. Um, I, we've seen this area change uh, quite remarkably over the last few years. And I'm just hoping it can be developed in a uh, orderly and, and maybe a little more eye-pleasing manner <laughs> because I don't think uh, some of the uh, developers have actually fulfilled their landscaping obligations. So, you know, we might have to keep an eye out for trying to bring this. This is one of the very few areas in the electoral areas that actually has the zoning to allow this kind of activity. And it's very precious. So I think we have to, you know, make it, make it uh, uh, as good as it can get. And uh, certainly this development, I think, uh, fits that. Thank you, Director Grieve. I don't see any other uh, comments or lights on, so I'll excuse the applicant. Um, do we have any other um, correspondence related to this application? I'm seeing not, okay. So then on receipt, um, all in favor of receiving the report? Opposed? And that's carried. The recommendation has been moved. 
I can second and comment on the recommendation to approve the lot line adjustment. Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Item number five, electoral area A rezoning for Island Highway South, Upper Island Developments for receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors and Jody McLean. Honor is here to uh, introduce this report and answer any of your questions. Great, thanks. Welcome, Jody. Hello, thanks, <clears throat> Madam Chair, Directors. The, this committee last reviewed this proposal back on August 25th, 2020. And since then, the external referrals were sent out and this report presents those responses in Appendix A of your package. To refresh your memory, the proposal is to rezone a 55 hectare parcel from a residential zone that it would allow for subdivision down to two hectare lots to a residential zone that would allow for subdivision down to 0.4 hectare lots, effectively increasing the de density of development potential from 23 potential lots to 113. To summarize the responses, the Advisory Planning Commission supported the proposal as proposed. The Vancouver Island Health Authority considers their interests unaffected at this stage, but will review again at the subdivision stage. The Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure requests a traffic impact study. School District 71 has expressed some concerns over the overcapacity of their local school. And the Comox First Nations have expressed some concerns regarding the number of septic fields the proposal would involve, rainwater management, and the protection of natural vegetation on, on, the, on the adjacent interim treaty agreement parcel. This referral process also coincided with the Union Bay Improvement District referendum and its subsequent conversion to a CVRD service. Appendix A includes the original Union Bay Improvement District response from their consulting engineers who oversaw the water system. That's Coors and Associates Engineering. They identify some upgrades to the water system that would need to occur to accommodate the proposed level and location of development. They recommended additional investigations take place to address extending water mains, storage, treatment capacity, the pressure zones and fire flows reaching the lots. Subsequently to this, the CBRD engineering department has pursued a water master plan to better understand the capabilities of that system given the existing development and the zoning potential for new development. The CVRD's long range planning documents, the regional growth strategy and the official community plan place this lot in the Union Bay settlement node. Though the settlement nodes are intended to promote complete communities and accommodate the majority of development occurring within the rural areas. The applicants are seeking to create a more dense development that is otherwise established. However, without community sewer system to service these proposed 113 lots. The CBRD is contemplating a larger regional sewer service for this general area. However, subdivision down to 0.4 hectare size lots in advance of the sewer service would make later connection complex and likely cost prohibitive. The RGS, the Regional Growth Strategy, advocates using settlement nodes for much more dense development with complete services. Also related to long range planning, the recent housing needs assessment did not identify market supplied rural single detached dwellings as a gap in the region's housing supply. Madam Chair, staff recognizes and appreciates the applicant is proposing community amenity contributions as a means to address some of the impacts of the development. Part of this proposal includes adding a one hectare expansion to the Ravine Nature Park. It would involve $200,000, $250,000 towards affordable housing and $50,000 towards active transportation measures. However, ultimately, staff recommends refusal of the application at this time as being premature with respect to the complete 
services reaching this part of the settlement node. Madam Chair, the applicants are in attendance today and can probably further expand on this. Great, thank you. If the applicant would like to, yeah, take a seat and if you want to add anything, just press the button and I can turn on your mic. Madam Chair, uh, Directors Grieve and Arbor, staff, um, it's good to be back here before committee. It's been a while. Um, I just want to add that the reason why we are back before committee today is because Director Arbor had asked that the committee um, be given an update on, on where we're at since it had been some time. And I think the best way to proceed would be for me to um, bring you up to date on how what has transpired since the last time we were here and then to provide some suggestions on how we could uh, go forward from here. Now, the last time we were here, the committee generally supported our rezoning application and voted to direct staff to negotiate community amenity contributions. This was done. We were preparing to go to public hearing when the grant application for the South Sewer Expansion Project came to light. We were then asked to be patient and wait for the results of the application. We were told that if the grant application was successful, there would be a meeting with all interested parties to discuss the impact. If the grant application was not successful, we would have support to continue with our rezoning application as it is. We all know that the original grant application was not successful. However, instead of getting support for our application as is, we were asked by staff to withdraw our application. Needless to say, this came as a surprise because this was not what we expected. We now understand that a new grant application has been completed and we're waiting for the result of that application. Now, first of all, I want to say that we support the regional district's new grant application, and we are willing to be a contributing partner. In this spirit of cooperation, and after several meetings with both planning and engineering staff, we drafted an amended rezoning application, taking into consideration both the evolving needs of the RD and our own. A copy was sent to each of the directors by email last week, and a hard copy was provided to you this morning. This amended application would allow us to proceed on a limited basis with 25 lots and hold the remaining property of approximately 100 acres for a later phase, assuming there will be a community sewer system in place. The reason for the initial 25 lots is twofold. It is the same number of lots that we are currently allowed under our existing zoning and it would allow us to generate income with which we could contribute to the sewer project. In the proposal, we offered to contribute between $7,500 and $10,000 for each additional lot permitted. We estimate that we could develop a further 200 lots on the remaining 100 acres. This would mean a potential contribution of up to $2 million to the new sewer project. I see this as a win-win solution. We should also point out that I've been in touch with the Comox First Nation, and we are working together to address their concerns. In fact, I met with two of their representatives a few months ago on site to inspect the trees and the wind corridors. I've also met with numerous neighboring homeowners who have shown great support for our proposed development. Therefore, I encourage you today to vote to direct staff to negotiate a partnership agreement with us similar to what is being done with other developers. Our proposed amended rezoning application can be used as a guideline for that agreement. We also ask that we work within a defined timeline because we've already been at this for over three years and the cost of over $150,000 to me personally. So we need to know where we are going soon. Of course, in order to be a contributing partner, we need to be on the same playing field as the other partners. This means that we need to have assurances on our rezoning. If our application is denied today, we will likely have to proceed to subdivide within our current zone, which would mean that we would not be a partner in the South Sewer Expansion Project and we would not contribute to it. This would mean a higher sewer cost for existing homeowners. It would also mean that up to 200 more homes would be denied from the housing supply. We all know that there is a housing shortage in our area. Our proposal will contribute to new housing supply 
in the growth area. In summary, I just want to remind the committee that uh, we had significant support for this rezoning application from the Advisory Planning Commission, from this committee, and even from staff up until recently. In fact, the former head of planning said that this application ticked all the boxes. So with your support, I'm confident that we can work out a mutually beneficial partnership agreement and rezoning application that will be acceptable to everyone and be a great benefit to our community. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Director Arbor. Thank you. Uh, thank you to staff and the applicant for some clarity around the update on this project. And it's true that it's been a couple of years since uh, we last saw you at this table with the proposal. Um, th there's a lot to unpack on this one. So, um, and that's exemplified both in the staff report and, and the, uh, the application. Um, so where to start? Um, you know, I, one place where I don't fully disagree with staff is on, uh, you know, the housing needs assessment. We know there's a shortage, but I, I think staff is correct that this single home is not the targeted in terms of affordable housing anyways. There's probably lots of demand, as we know, all across Vancouver Island for market housing. But um, I think that's what staff is re referencing in, uh, in the report. So I do agree with that. Um, and it's and the patience on on everyone is is um, you know has been um, difficult at times because um, you know that there's definitely some stuff on the other side that I wish we already had in place. So for example, staff is talking about the water master plan and that was supposed to be delivered in January, as I mentioned at a different meeting. So the regional district has to do their job. We, we have to um, deliver on the things that we say we will. I know there's been issues um, through COVID and otherwise, but um, I think when we talk with different uh, applicants or partners um, and we set the bar a certain way, it's always more difficult when you move the stick and down the road and you're not able to provide answers on your end. Same with the sewage, I guess, which this one is a little bit out of, out of our control because we are um, working really hard to, to try to secure provincial and federal partners on this. My view is we can't afford to um, lose partners on this project or potential partners. Um, it is, I mean, uh, a comment from staff was, you know, the, uh, the settlement nodes are not meant to really be complete communities, but um, I think in the case of the union-based settlement knows, I, I think we're very much working towards a complete community. When you're talking about having zoning in place for 3,300 homes and the existing homes and Comox First Nation Treaty land, we have to be realistic that this in 50 or 100 years from now will be a town. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't think that we're just, uh, working on the edges of of just having a cute little settlement node that that uh, that does that is not properly serviced as a proper community otherwise we will have some serious traffic issues <laughs> in Tukorni if that community is not self self-sustaining and has all the attributes that you would have expect of a community that size um, and, and and I believe that's understood not only by the rural areas but by our municipal partners as well you know, I, I don't think that's a political issue. I think people understand that based on the historical decisions, Union Bay is set for a lot of growth. So that's the context. Um, in terms of the application, um, yeah, it is tricky because if, if we don't get the, we do want sewage. So when we talk about community amenity contribution, we're looking at um, things that are, may not be the must have, you know, the must have is, is, is sewage, <laughs> right? So it's, it's to try to figure out some commitments that once the pipe is in place, that we can, you know, we get, we get those connections and we get the critical mass and we get people into the project. For the affordable housing contribution, just feedback for staff, you know, 
one disappointment I had was that the proposed contribution, I think the staff report says that it could go into the, uh, the homelessness service. And it's the same as what we've negotiated with um, Union Bay Estates, I believe, which is set to give a, a million bucks upon our final approvals. I'm really concerned. I, I would love to see those community and amenity contribution going towards affordable housing stuff. And, and, and I've mentioned it before in Union Bay, right? If we're going to have a complete community, I believe that any amount that we get should be set aside for affordable housing in the community of Union Bay. Um, so that's feedback for staff. Again, it's uh, uh, I'm glad that we're negotiating, but that's what we're here today is for feedback. So based on the fact that we haven't delivered, and, and, and there's a big emphasis on that in the staff report around the water master plan, it's now March. This was supposed to be in our hands by now. It was, and, and I understand why we need it because we're looking at the fairness and the distribution across different committed partners, existing residents, Comox First Nation. So we need that report. So for me, it's it's really hard to, de to, to decline something and push the applicant back a year, you know, by declining this application when we haven't done our piece of the puzzle, which we should have in hand by now. So I'm, I'm really leaning on, and then staff does give us option two, which is precisely that, you know, to, to, to have a little more time so that we get that water, to not kill the application, to keep working with the applicant towards a negotiation that makes sense for all partners, because I think the applicant is right. I guess the risk for us is if we're taking too long and project potential project partners, vote on switch or otherwise kind of say, well, mm -hmm. enough of that, you know, um, they, uh, unless staff corrects me, the applicant could go and subdivide for the 25 lots and not participate in everything that, that he said, right? That's, that's one of our risks on the other side. So, um, yeah, I would like to see, obviously hear from other directors and staff, I would lean on option two to not kill this, to keep the conversation going, um, realizing that we have some deliverables on our side as well, and that they've been long coming. It is unfortunate we didn't get the first switch grant because I think otherwise we'd be a happy room right now. So I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Green. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, and through the chair and CEO to staff. Um, so the fees and, and, uh, and, uh, and charges by law uh, that's already been paid by, by the developer, um, if this is defeated today, does that go back to the developer? Or is he, is he on the hook for that, regardless of the decision? Through Madam Chair to Director um, Grieve. Um, so uh, I believe your question was, does any of their fees um, is returned if the application is, is refused? And, and the answer is no fees would be um, will, will be given back to their to the applicant because we went through a bunch of stages. Um, staff has been working on this application for a, a um, number of times. It went through a, a bunch of um, committee meetings and APC meetings. So through certain stages, um, if if the applicant uh, hits those um, hit those marks, um, um, and then this applicant has went through these marks, that no re um, refund would be returned back to the applicant. So basically, we've come this far. We've done quite a lot of work. So um, you know, it's obvious that we have to keep talking and keep this thing going forward. Uh, you referenced the fact that it takes a little longer to do stuff. Um, I think the original uh, Weldwood uh, property uh, subdivision idea was what 1985 or something that. Just, whole development was first broached <laughs> in Union Bay. So no one can ever accuse the regional district of moving at lightning speed. It's not all ours, of course. There's a lot of other people that came into play, like, of course, Ministry of Forest Lands and Operations and their little uh, intervention. Um, no, I think uh, what has to be remembered is uh, that the developer can go ahead under the old zoning and and uh, do 23 lots that um, potentially 
with that size lot, you could do on-site water and on-site septic, correct? Through Madam Chair to Director Grieve, yes. So through, if the applicant did decide to apply for a subdivision, their subdivision application would be sent, um, they would have to apply to the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure. Through their process, um, Bank of Island Health would, would look at their, um, this private system in regards to water and sewer. The regional district is, we don't regulate that type of um, infrastructure in, 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 our, in our jurisdiction. I know, but I'm just saying that it's a big enough lot size then to, to uh, possibly get approval from Island Health for an on, on site system, system all the way. Through Madam Chair to Director Brief, yes. Um, um, my experience with um, Ministry of Transportation and Island Health is these lot size are um, tend to be supported by Island Health. And usually, yeah. Yes. So one, one hectare is usually what they're looking at, minimum, isn't it? Yes, and and it, and there's there's lots of criteria regards to how they look at uh, the site. So even though with the one hectare site, uh, it's it's all about what's on on the land there to make sure that that the the soil is compatible to what they want to do. Of course, all that. So, in other words, um, he would still be able to put in say forty six dwelling units if they have but it would all would that be uh, would the lot size be big enough to accommodate two full-size houses then or would one have to be 960 square feet yeah that's correct the current zone would allow for two full-size houses if the lots are over a certain size so that's not so bad uh, that might be a possibility for the developer uh, but and getting back to some of the comments I made earlier, I mean, we talk about, you know, that uh, densification will, will be uh, will be uh, provided when services uh, are provided uh, through annexation into the municipality and all the uh, all the uh, the language out of the regional growth strategy that is so far to date now that it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, so. I don't know. I mean, we've got um, possibility of, a, of, uh, of some contribution going for the sewer. Um, we have a, a developer moving ahead with his his own uh, uh, waste disposal system with the Ministry of Environment. Right, that would be for for Unity of States because it's too big for VHA. So was there a possibility then that Mr. Sexton could put in his own um, sewage system that would uh, be compliant with the MOE as well? So just sidestep the whole thing, like uh, the other developer there's doing or planning on doing. In any case, I'm trying to make the point that this all works contrary to purpose. And we're talking about you know, even in the Comox Convention, we're talking about people putting septic systems in, in the 2020s. You know, it's, it, surely you don't need a crystal ball to see that we need public amenities like sewer to, to for the, the environmental safety, especially in, in the Bain Sound area. So, I mean, I don't know what to do. Um, I think our, our directors, Working on this uh, about twenty five hours a day, I think, uh, trying to get get this thing to move forward. Uh, we, we're totally dependent on senior government grants. Um, obviously, we you know we don't have the wherewithal as a electoral area to you know just fund magically a, a, some kind of a, a sewer system for the area, but. I mean, this is an opportunity if we let it slip through our fingers. I mean, obviously the developer can move ahead and do something different. And I know that we talk about densification in the core, and I know we are steering people into these new $800,000 single bedroom apartments in Courtney. They're supposed to be affordable housing. But, you know, really this, this would be something that could add to the pot and maybe make it happen, maybe be enough to, to push us over the edge. And I mean that in a good way. <laughs> um, because, you know, the, in the end, there's a lot of options, but there's only right, one right answer. And, and that's to have a publicly, uh, a public uh, uh, 
waste disposal, liquid waste disposal system in that area. So whatever it takes to make that happen, um, obviously the community itself has to get behind it. You know, when you talk about $20,000 being a, a big price to hook up to a sewer, you know, what can you get for $20,000 these days? A, a, a half decent secondhand car that might last eight to 10 years, that's about it. So you have to put things in perspective and look at things with the 2022 vision that we have right now. So I would be in favor of, of somehow kicking this down the road, keeping it alive and, and working behind the scenes as hard as we can to come to the, the appropriate solution for the Union Bay Bain Sound area. Thank you. Thanks, to Director Grief. Um, I have a couple of my own questions. Um, you know, the applicant and the directors have noted uh, an application to uh, senior level of government for South Sewer. Um, would staff be able to comment on um, if this application could fit into that, um, if this proposal would fit into that um, South Sewer application, like location wise? Is it is it possible to connect into an already existing application? Um, the application made uh, for um, sewer to the south is principally to the benefit of existing residents on septic systems. Um, generally speaking, uh, grant applications can't support um, development or seem to directly support development. But having said that, um, we can work in partnership as we are with Comox First Nations and Union Bay Estates in terms of sharing the infrastructure costs. So whether this proposal is part of that grant application or not is, is um, um, would not amend or vary the application mm -hmm. or change that application process. But certainly Mr. Saxton has presented to the, uh, to the committee today an alternative that he wishes to pursue. Um, Director Arbor mentioned a, a second option that's in the report to, to delay this because there are other issues other than sewer. And the report identifies those, including the water matter. And, and option two does buy you time for staff to work with Mr. Saxon with respect to sewer and the other issues and ensure that we have the information from that water study that will be essential for the water component of this project too. Thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Saxon has, has proposed a phased approach to um, development and possibly you know, a, smaller, a smaller development initially. Um, the one concern that I have, you know, having also had uh, residents in my area um, kind of resist connecting to a, uh, you know, a system when they've already invested in or they are already is a septic system. Um, is it possible under, um, you know, the negotiations that funds be set aside to eventually connect to um, a system? Is that something that can be negotiated as part of um, as part of the agreement? Yeah, certainly if, if the uh, if the committee gives us the direction to work with Mr. Saxton, we'll explore those alternatives with them and uh, and, and get back to the committee with the, the results of that. Yeah, because as much as you know, I heard Director Greaves say, well, the developer could install a, a system, you know, having uh, two such systems in area B have to be, you know, turned over to the regional district. I, I just, I'm very wary of, of those types of systems that are privately funded and then not properly financed in the future for, um, you know, for future use and expansion and, and maintenance. Um, so my preference would be to not go down that route, but instead um, set up for connecting into um, a community system that that is already you know present publicly owned. Um, and then just a comment about uh, the the referral back from SD seventy one. Um, is I'm not sure if there's anything that does the regional district. What, what do we do in terms of a school district that says there's not enough um, potential space in schools to uh, support families that are moving into the area? Is there is there an option for them to? Um, how how is that then managed? Um, Jody, do you do you have any response to the school district's concerns and and, and that issue? Yes, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. It, it's just it is something that is on the school district's radar. They are looking at a potential school site in the Union Bay Developments um, Estates Development Project there uh, for a future school 
uh, and then they'd have to apply to the Ministry of Education to actually build the school. So it's on their mind. It's a long range, long term um, project, though, that doesn't get done very quickly. Okay, thanks. Director Arger. Thanks. I'll comment on that point, too, because in Area 8, uh, schools have been uh, a hot point of uh, discussion the last few months because. Royston is overflowing and we've had to move people from, the school district has had to move people from the Ridge in Courtney to Courtney L. So it's been a traumatic event for a lot of parents in Royston L. But I would point out that the school district a number of years ago did close the Union Bay Elementary School, which has a, an existing site. The building itself is probably, um, well, I won't comment on it because I don't know, but I imagine it's probably quite challenged <laughs> to reanimate it. So they do have options. We also know there's probably a need just as a plug for a high school long term on this side of the river. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. There's three on the other side of the river. <laughs> so I'm sure the SD71 has a lot on their minds, but I think Jody is right that long term they have negotiated with UBE for a site, which looks really good. And but that's contingent on all of these things happening <laughs> and of us figuring out the sewage because one of the reasons why they did not expand Royston is they actually mentioned in their deliberation that it was not serviced by sewage. So it's not just Union Bay, it's Royston as well. So there's a lot at stake, which is why I think we need to keep working on this. Um, one last comment and for Mr. Saxton. Um, I think you made the comment earlier, which unfortunately I, need, I think I need to burst that bubble. We can't really, I think you said, you know, with the other partners have um, basically their, their rezoning or zoning figured out or guaranteed um, in the, I would say that in the case of Comox First Nation regarding their treaty lands, that's not guaranteed. They need to go through treaty. Um, they, they do have some options with their private laws and union based states, they do have their rezoning, but what we can't do is guarantee rezoning because rezoning ultimately needs to go through public hearing process, et cetera, right? With, with significant public input and other referrals. Uh, so I wish we could, um, as part of those negotiations, I think we can show good intent in terms of trying to figure out something that's attractive to everybody involved, including existing residents, but uh, that, that might be one place where we fall a little bit short. So. Um, on, on guaranteeing rezoning, but hopefully we can keep you at the table. That's what I hope that we get everybody in the same boat to get the sewage project going at minimal cost to existing residents. And you've shown willingness to participate in that and some new ideas around um, alternative solutions. So I, and I hear our CEO maybe says, you know, maybe staff could live with option two to try to explore a little bit uh, what that could look like. So I'm hoping that we can all walk away today with, with uh, that notion. Thanks. Thanks. Dr. Grieve? Yes, further that. And when it comes to the school board, it's, um, you know, I'm not going to shed a tear for them because uh, 25 years ago, um, they decided that, that women weren't going to have any more babies and they didn't need schools and they sold off property. Uh, they, they, you look at uh, Solom Junior High, which is a real contentious issue out there. Um, Fanny Bay, um, Black Creek, down, uh, and Oyster, Oyster River Elementary, which is in Area D, but still, you know, that, that, that kind of thinking uh, wasn't very productive. So, you know, it is what it is. And if you're having kids, you got to have schools, and it's not our purview. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia. Um, I don't see any other comments. I'll excuse the applicant then from the table. Thank you very much. On receipt, all in favor? Opposed, that's carried unanimously. And someone would like to make a recommendation? Director Arbor? Um, thank you. And I, I'm just trying to think if I want to make adjustments to options to, to capture today's discussion. Refer the applicant. Well, first of all, I'd, I'd like to not proposed option one. So my motion will be to refer the application to a future meeting that is to occur after the Union Bay Water Master Plan is completed. Now, that's being said, if I make that motion, you know very well, I will ask the question as to when we will see that Water Master Plan. Uh, you can comment now if you do. I'll just ask Mark to, to uh, provide some insight as to the progress on the Master Plan and whether or not a date can be provided to you at this time. 
I'll, I'll second that motion just so that we can speak to it. Yeah, yeah through the CAO and through the chair. So uh, we are progressing that work and uh, we're planning to receive the report from the consultant in April and uh, bring it forward to the EASC in May. Yeah, thank you for that timeline, Director Arbor. Okay, so I'd like to refer the application to a future meeting. Uh, no, I'd like to refer the application to a future meeting that is to occur after the Indian Bay Water Master Plan is completed. And that is known what, if any, water system improvement are necessary for the Indian Bay Water System to accommodate this development. I guess I can live with that. I would say, and further, that staff, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, and maybe I'll ask for assistance for the CEO because earlier you referenced that you were, or can we just deal with this motion and then do a, a separate motion on the second part? Because I want, you said you are seeking in a way a mandate or some type of direction from the board as to if there's other things to consider with the applicant, such as sewage or alternative proposal. So, I could bundle it all in one motion or just um, my advice to the and further would be that and staff work with the applicant to uh, uh, consider and address the other matters in the staff report. Oh, does that work? Well, it does encapsulate it. Uh, and, and in terms of, of, of the, the staff report and what the applicant has submitted as well. Um, because I, I, is that is that okay? Yes, and the applicant's um, uh, modification. Yes, that would be okay. Very so, so I'll move that, and further. So number two, and further, that uh, staff work with the applicant to address other matters identified in the staff report, as well as the uh, proposal, updated proposal from the applicant. So, the staff report and updated. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so that motion's on the table, Director Grief. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe define it a little further in that, um, you know, the communication um, that the, this development be uh, uh, also taken in consideration uh, with respect to the sewer. That the, the I, I was sort of in there, but it didn't say it specific. Can it say sewer and other other uh, uh, proposal? How do you put it? Yeah, because I think it, it has to be stated uh, that you know that from now on that this should be considered along with KFN, along with uh, Union Bay Estates, as as being part of the South Sewer Project, okay. or at least consideration. So we've included sewer in the um, in the in the motion. Sewer servicing. Include sewer sewer servicing. Okay. Yes. Is everyone happy with that motion? Okay. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Would we like to take a five minute break, stretch legs, and then uh, we'll we'll come back for the the next round. Great. Do not get not bad eat.
All right, I'll call the meeting back to order. We are on item number four, I believe. Oh, no, no, six. Thank you. We've already skipped. Area C, area C site specific exemption to the floodplain management bylaw 7938 Lenwood Road for receipt. Moved and seconded. Over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Jody McLean is here to present this report and answer any of your questions. Welcome, Jody. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the owners, Mark Rickaby, is also online here and can further explain what's going on in the property. So this application is part of a larger package that the owners have prepared to rectify some development that's occurred on the lot. They're seeking to complete a building permit that was commenced back in 1994, but abandoned partway through inspections, and to get a building permit for some new additions that occurred in 2015. As part of their building permit review, uh, it was found that the expansions to the, that happened to the deck in 2015 were made in contravention of the CBRD floodplain management bylaw. All other additions were legally cited though. Instead of removing the deck, the owners have opted to apply for the site-specific exemption to the floodplain bylaw with the support of a report by a professional engineer and a consulting biologist. The engineer has concluded that the deck is safe for the intended use. Madam Chair, should the board approve the application, which staff recommends, then the staff will proce process their development permit that addresses the habitat values within the vicinity of the shoreline and continue with the building permit. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Um, does the applicant have anything to add to the, uh, the presentation? No, I just thank you for the opportunity to participate today and uh, thank uh, Regent staff for their patience, guidance and uh, professionalism throughout. It's, uh, it's been very, uh, very informative and helpful. Thank you. Do directors have any questions? Um, I had one question, um, Jody. When we normally see um, a floodplain um, specific application, there's usually some commentary or some wording in the resolution around insurance um, indemnification. Can you comment as to why that might not be here? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so it should be in the second part of the, of the um, recommendation. At the bottom, it's, 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 it says, uh, as well as an acknowledgement, no debt disaster financial assistance funding is available. Um, and identifying that the regional district is liable from any damage, damages in the event of a flooding or erosion. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I missed that. Um, Director Arbor? Just out of curiosity, like was this triggered by a complaint or that's the applicant like coming on their own to want to be in compliance with bylaws? Because the latter we don't get too many of. Thank you. It was a voluntary uh, building inspection that the applicants had or the owners asked for. That's great. Um, normally, you know, I wouldn't. <laughs> It's hard to approve these things without trying, sort of showing that you're you're being lenient on on your own bylaws. But I know those reports, those professional reports, couldn't have been cheap. So I I see that there was a fair amount of cost to this, Director Arbor. Yeah, I think agreed, and and um, yeah, it's the <laughs> and I don't know if the property changed ownership or whatnot as well, right? But uh, yeah, uh, on the islands we see a lot of uh, forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> But in this case, actually, when, when somebody uh, brings it forward themselves, I think that that needs to be noted and that doesn't guarantee that we would approve it. But looking at everything, as you see in the reports and also the pictures and, and all that, it, it doesn't seem to be, uh, you know, it, it seems to be uh, so supportable for sure. Thanks. Thank you. I don't see any other questions from the table. I'll excuse the applicant and we'll vote on receipt. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We have a recommendation. 
Second. Moved and seconded. And um, I won't read out the full recommendation, but it is including um, the restricted covenant, the acknowledgement of dis no disaster financial assistance, and the re release and indemnification of the CDRD. Uh, comments on the recommendation? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Sorry, did I miss you, Director Grief? Is your light on? Just a comment. Uh, just a comment. In in the interest of uh, preserving your investment, I think you need a few cans of stain. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe a few hands to uh, apply them. There you go. What happened to the kids? Don't they come home once in a while? Put them to work. Director Not Green. enough. <laughs> Director Greaves uh, volunteering to roll up sleeves. I don't know. <laughs> Will that be on the record? Yeah. A service. A service. A service. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, moving on to item number eight and uh, very much uh, in line with what we've just said. Oh, sorry, we're at seven. Uh, sorry, Kensington Comprehensive Development Permit uh, for Island Highway uh, for receipt. Moved and seconded over to staff. Thank you very much. And Jody McLean will present this report and answer any of your questions. Thanks, Jody. Thank you, Madam Chair, Directors. The official community plan includes a development permit area that applies solely to the Union Bay Estates Development Project. It largely addresses form and character criteria. The permit in front of you today addresses a subdivision of 9.7 hectare area along the waterfront, and it requires consistency with the guidelines that relate to subdivision. Those guidelines are grouped for convenience in your report. Generally, overall design, orientation, uh, road and sidewalk design, lighting, natural environment, landscaping, energy, and signage and street furniture. So the yeah on the screen there, you can see what the general site plan looks like. It has a line of single attached dwellings facing the water with three multifamily developments behind it. And there's connections to the waterfront on either side of the road. Uh, the guidelines do have considerations for accessibility and pedestrian friendly access, pedestrian friendly streets and traffic calming designs. <clears throat> the proposed design is consistent or exceeds the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure's rural design standards. They do include rural sidewalks and appropriate sidewalk widths and ramps and letdowns and tree-lined boulevard. The lighting is confirmed to be dark sky approved by the International Dark Sky Association. On the natural environment, those kind of factors were considered in a separate development permit uh, that was overseen by a professional biologist. And this, de this development permit is consistent with those recommendations. And after clearing and grubbing, there is landscaping that's involved and the results uh, in, in scope of this uh, proposal is the vegetative boulevards, which will be hydro seeded and lined with trees. On energy, the subdivision design is including publicly available electricity and natural gas. There's no specific solar, geothermal, or district energy system proposed in the subdivision at this time. And similarly, no street furniture or signage is proposed at this time. Madam Chair, this subdivision is consistent with the zoning bylaw and the development permit guidelines. Therefore, staff is recommending it be approved as presented. Thank you. And would the applicant like to add anything? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no, we have nothing to add. Uh, Mr. McLean has done an excellent job summarizing the proposal. Great, right, thank you. I'll open it up for questions then from the directors. Director Arger. Yeah, I just want to say this uh, This came up at the EPC and um, there was a lot of uh, positive feedback and clarification as well from Kevin, which was really helpful. Um, a lot of questions and um, all of which were, were answered. And that was, you know, all the different EPC members um, came with a different understanding of whether this applied just to this particular zone or other zones. and. Um, but overall, at, at, by the end of the meeting, I think it was unanimous that people found that this this was doing a good job of uh, laying out around the site. 
So, and I found the same myself, um, notwithstanding <laughs> all the other issues from our prior conversation regarding sewage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but just on the, uh, the forming character and the, the kind of plan, the subdivision plan, it, it was pretty good. Thank you. Thanks, Director Arbor. Um, I had a question to staff, and um, this might actually be an Atlanta question because it has to do with the, the coastal flooding. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that uh, this development, you know, I didn't see it highlighted um, this region specifically in our coastal flood map um, plan, but um, just want to make sure that we are not contributing to a problem in the future, seeing that, you know, the Heart Creek is right there. Um, is, is this area potentially prone to flooding? And Kevin, if you want to um, add anything for sure. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Uh, we actually have done a flood construction level assessment of all of these lands, uh, and we've had a, a coastal engineer actually review it for flood construction level, uh, particularly in regards to the fact that it's directly adjacent to Heart Creek, but also in regards to sea level rise and potential sea level rise inundation. That has been provided to the regional district for review as part of the overall project and something we did as part of our environmental review for the site. Great. And so no, no problems were flagged? Uh, to the chair, no, no problems were flagged. Uh, what we have found is that all of the properties that you are seeing on the on the uh, subdivision plan can meet the flood construction level requirements that were identified in the in the report. Great, thank you. And anything that staff want to add? No. Okay, Director Arbor. Yeah, I would note that that bottom line there along the shore would also be a regional district park. Um, so I guess we'll have. Uh, We'll have our own analysis to do around if there's a, a trail or walkway or anything like that uh, to do around uh, the potential impacts of. So I don't know if staff wants to comment on that. What our processes would be for that when we look at uh, foreshore parks and trails, whether uh, we we flag anything ourselves internally around this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, as you can see, there's a that comes from part of the master development agreement that requires the applicant provide a certain uh, width of park along the shoreline. Uh, and yeah, it's it's intended to be a, a walkway along there. Uh, and the the applicant is working with our parks department to to address development of that and either in terms of a walkway or what have you there. Um, yeah, uh, is that answer your question? In climate lands, yeah, um, the 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 applicants have provided um, some mapping that illustrates the flood level rise that would occur in that area, and then South staff was able to ensure that oh, there's sufficient buildable area on their private lots um, to accommodate the, the zone's potential, uh, and yeah, the, that that area along that water course, the water the shoreline there would. See the sea level rise up there, which we'd have to, when we build a walkway, have to take that consideration and the type of walkway and type of improvements to get put in there. Okay, thank you, Director Green. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I would just commend uh, that uh, this is one of the first times I think where they actually built the uh, the concept of a foreshore walkway right into the development rather than us having to scramble and buy pieces and put it together ourselves after the fact. So I think we're finally getting there. Thank you. Thanks. I don't see any other questions from the directors. I'll excuse the applicant from the table. We'll vote on receipt. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We have a recommendation. Moved and seconded to move the development permit forward. Any comments on the recommendation? Hearing and seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you, Kevin. All right, now we get on to the coastal flood adaptation strategy for receipt. Moved and seconded and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Robin Holmes, Senior Long Range Planner is here to present this report and answer any of your questions. Thanks, welcome Robin. Good morning. Oh, that's sorry, that's loud. 
Shrew, Madam Chair, and the CEO to the directors. Staff are here today to provide you with the results from the second phase of the coastal flood adaptation strategy. As you may recall, last year when we were here, um, the uh, CVRD received funding from UBCM's uh, Community Emergency Preparedness Fund for $150,000 to undertake coastal adaptation planning. Building on the coastal flood mapping hazard work that we did in phase one, phase two was grounded through engagement activities, a risk assessment, and then focusing on building in-house and external stakeholder capacity. We explored adaptation options and developed a decision making process that would enable implementation and to plan for next steps. The CVRD retained Ebb Water Consulting as the engineer technical lead with engagement support from SHIP Collaborative. The project was initiated last spring with the engagement process primarily um, being undertaken towards the end of spring and then throughout fall. We held an information session at the end of November that was highly attended with over 200 registrants and this helped us complete our project. The final project, or sorry, the final report contains recommendations with next, next steps and then in, in near-term next steps, which have been identified for the next one to two years. This work has been identified through the 2022-2023 Electoral Area Planning Services financial planning process. And this has been attached as Appendix B. Um, the staff report identifies two scenarios for moving forward um, with grant funding and without grant funding. Uh, in January of this year, staff submitted an application to the Intac Foundation um, Municipal Climate Resiliency Grant Fund for $100,000. If we are successful in receiving this money, staff will be able to undertake all three of the priority actions that have been identified in the final report. Thames and Lyle from Ebwater Consulting is here with us today to walk us through the project, the recommendations, and these near-term next steps that I have mentioned. Pass it over to Tamsin, please. Thanks. Welcome, Thames. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, lovely. I can't actually see. I can only see Robin, but I know you're all there. <laughs> um, it's lovely to engage with you again. So my name is Tamsin Lyle. I was the project manager and lead of this project and we've all met at some point along the way. So I am sitting here, sat here in Vancouver in the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. Um, but I'm excited to speak to you about the project that we did um, on your side of the water in the territory of the Comox First Nation. I'm just gonna put up my, my slides if that's okay. I'm gonna stop. I'm bumping somebody off, apologies. No, I think you can share screen. Okay, here we go. You're bumped off. Um, right, so I just wanted to um, acknowledge the rest of our team here. We had quite a lot of people working on this project from my company, Upwater, as well as from Shift Collaborative. Um, and we had a pretty uh, fun time, I would say, working together and working with you along the way. And I certainly want to acknowledge uh, the staff support that we got on this project from uh, Lana and from Robin, um, as well as uh, you as uh, directors, um, who uh, really came to our uh, workshops with uh, intent and interest and amazing thoughts that I think really speak uh, highly of the community that you have uh, over in the Comox Valley. So I'm gonna try and keep this quite short because I know this meeting is getting long for you folks. So, and also you've been along with us along our journey. So I don't need to go into all the details about why this is you know, a problem and all of the things that we've talked to you about previously. But just a reminder that the overall project goal, or at least the, the, um, the coastal flood adaptation strategy goal is to minimize risks and vulnerabilities and increase community resilience. Uh, sort of very high level, lofty, lofty goals, um, but certainly something to strive for. But when we get down to the nitty gritty, there are sort of three questions um, that we need to start thinking about as communities uh, to support on coastal adaptation with sea level rise. And the first one is to identify where do we need to act first? Uh, what are we gonna do in those areas that will you know, have the best outcome for everybody? And when do we actually have to get moving um, in these areas? So with these three questions in mind, uh, we took some deliberate steps to help try and answer some of those questions. So just a reminder of what has already been done um, in the regional district. So in, as Robin just mentioned, 
Uh, KWL um, completed some coastal flood hazard mapping over the last couple of years. We have a pretty good grounding now of different water levels and where that water is going to be and how high it's going to be. Um, and then the next step is really to identify where to act first. So where is this the biggest concern? Where, where are the things in the way of that water? Um, and then using that to determine what we need to do um, and then ultimately figure out uh, when to act through an implementation strategy. Um, and just a reminder that this project, this phase two project that we've been working on really focused on identifying those risks um, as well as developing a, a decision process that can support in future to uh, determine what to do and when to do it in different communities. So my mouse, there we go. So our project objectives uh, were twofold. Just a re reiterating here, one to better understand risk. And if you all remember our risk triangle, so risk is really about the intersection of that water, the bad thing with the things that we care about. Um, and then secondly, to develop an inclusive decision process um, to choose and implement adaptation actions in process, in, in future rather. Um, and you would have seen this um, along the way in our workshops, and it's also recorded in the very long tome um, that we provided in terms of a report, but it's also a nice, I think it's 15 page summary report, uh, which probably some of you have read, um, that highlights some of the, the risk in the region. So when we think about risk, um, it's, it's very complex and systemic, and I think we've all discussed this before, so I won't go into details, but some key, some key things that I think are really important um, is that uh, if we look at the intersection of people um, in terms of where they currently live and the regional district, about 10% of the current population currently lives within a flood hazard area. Uh, and uh, that will increase slightly into the future. But another big takeaway here is that actually it's the present day risk is of you know, reasonable concern. Um, and it doesn't actually change that much in time with sea level rise, just as a function of the, the topography of the region um, that you have these shallow areas, but then they're, they're banked by some fairly steep areas. And so that the total area of floodplain doesn't increase significantly over time. And so if we look at people, for example, you've been talking this morning already about developments in Saratoga Beach, obviously a high area of risk, uh, Little River um, and the Comox Road area, as well as the, the uh, jurisdictions that sort of fit within the CBRD um, in the city of Courtney and Comox, there's quite a lot of risk that has been identified to people. Um, another key uh, takeaway uh, in terms of the financial implications of a large coastal flood event, we identified about $550 million worth of uh, property that sits in the current present day floodplain. So that's the value of land and uh, buildings. And that's, that's a very sort of simple, simplified uh, an analysis and, and result. And it would be actually much more than that. I think we've all experienced now a, a fairly significant event in our region and recognize that there are lots of indirect impacts and the financial implications are much bigger than the, the direct uh, impacts. Um, and the other piece I think is to note on these graphics up on the screen here is that there's a risk across the whole of the CVRD coastline. It's not specifically in one spot, but there are differences in what that risk looks like depending on where you are. So if you're looking at people, Saratoga Beach is a big concern, but if you're looking at some of the archeological um, uh, artifacts that we know about, then there are other areas closer to to Union Bay and further south that are, are of concern. So it's, it's a very different story. So it's not, it's not, um, it's uh, not homogenous um, in terms of what's going on in the, in the region and therefore the responses and the adaptation options that you should be looking towards um, should be different. So in summary, what I've just said, basically risk is spread across the region. Um, and the other big summary takeaway piece that we learned through this work is that the risk is present today in many of these areas and it's not going to increase dramatically in the future. It absolutely will increase, but the, the takeaway on that is really it's, it's time to start adapting now um, and not necessarily worrying about this, this scary sort of monster in the future of climate change. There's lots of things that can be done today to reduce the near-term risk. So that was the first part of the project that we conducted, but then I think the more interesting part of the work that we did that you joined us on along the way was really to support developing uh, inclusive and holistic structure for decision-making in these areas, recognizing that flood is a wicked problem, super complex, uh, lots, of, lots of systemic 
risks and lots of uh, really tough decisions ahead um, in terms of the responses that can be taken um, because there are lots of different values that inform why people choose to live in these beautiful coastal areas and what they're willing to accept into the future. So we nominally chose um, or, or followed what's called a structured decision-making process to do this, which is basically a values-driven process where we spend a lot of time talking to folks like yourselves um, as well as other stakeholders to understand what it is that creates the communities and, and what it is that you value about living in the Comox Valley and especially um, on the uh, beach or the, the floodplain areas. And then using that information to support uh, developing a decision matrix um, and criteria, and then also looking at that um, following through in terms of what the options are available to support adaptation that basically uh, do their best to meet those values and then comparing them lots of iterations, et cetera. So as a reminder, we did do a fair amount of uh, engagement on this project with uh, stakeholders and partners, um, including yourselves. Um, we did not engage with the public. We just informed the public um, towards the end of the project. Um, and that was done sort of intentionally with purpose uh, because Flood uh, is, is very, can be very emotional um, and very complex. It's not a simple thing to uh, jump into. So the whole point here was really to build up capacity uh, with stakeholders and within the CDRD and the partners to get them to understand, get everybody sort of on the same page in understanding the complexity of this problem so that everybody can work together to support that conversation with the public. Uh, so we did do lots of stakeholder engagement though. We had quite a few meetings that are up on the, on the, on, on the screen here. Um, noting that, of course, we did this through COVID, not our choice um, and or not, not our preference, obviously no one's preference um, to be in, a, in COVID, but um, it was it meant that we did all of our engagement online, but I, I think that through this process, you were lucky enough to be sort of second and third um, in, in terms of other projects we were doing with engagement, and so we were able to uh, use some, some interesting tools, I think, and hopefully we managed to get the, well, we did manage to get the information that we did and hopefully we did that in an engaging way. Um, we then used all of that information to develop um, some criteria to support decision-making in the future. There's this very long-winded table that's available to you in the report. It's also very easily digestible in a summary table. But the point here is that we were really trying to bring in the values that we heard that were relevant to the Comox uh, area or Comox Valley area to support those decisions and things that we heard loud and clear, for example, that it was really nature and recreation that brings people to to live in your community and work in your community. And so we need to make sure that those things are reflected in any decision making going forward. Like that, that nature piece is very, very strong. I think you can see that in that in this little word cloud here. Um, some other things that we heard uh, later on in the process that we didn't um, include particularly well because it, we heard it later on and it's very challenging to include was the idea of equity and recognizing that there are some serious challenges with equity in the region and that some of these adaptation decisions going forward will really potentially challenge that even more and so it's important to consider issues of socioeconomic uh, equity um, when making choices to make sure that everybody is rising up together. Um, we then uh, dove into one neighborhood in particular. We chose it uh, because it had a lot of challenges associated with uh, um, coastal flooding, so the Saratoga neighborhood. You brought it up today already in your meeting. Um, and we also chose it because it was a fairly uh, concrete and sort of scoped uh, problem. So there was only one jurisdiction, for example, and there was you know, a fairly simple neighborhood structure in there. So that's why we chose the neighborhood. It wasn't because it's the most hazardous or for any other reason, except that it was a really good opportunity to, to work through this process and to figure out what we need to, to change in future. Um, and so in the Saratoga neighborhood, which we used, for example, we went through a process of looking at different adaptation options um, from hard structural options through much softer options using what's called the PARAR um, framework, which stands for protect, adapt, retreat, um, avoid, and resilience. Um, and so we looked at all of these different options in different formats and different like building the blocks in different ways, uh, provided a lot of graphics, for example, to try and tell the story, to learn through that process in terms of the trade-offs, like what people's gut responses to some of these options were and therefore learning from them what is important to consider in future decision-making. 
Um, we then compared all of the options that were available. We did this quite a few different ways. We, we did some sort of very simplified sort of extreme um, scenarios where we looked at a dike, for example, and then complete retreat, for example, on the extreme. And then we worked together to develop uh, sort of softer grouped uh, options. And we gave them fun names like dancing out of the way, which was basically a, a retreat based concept, but in a very slow methodical um, and maybe artsy way. Um, and we also looked at resilience options um, through strengthen, strengthening the village. And then we compared them and had lots of discussion around what makes sense for this community. Uh, the takeaway I think from this exercise was that the do nothing option is absolutely a no-go. So I think that gives you as direction um, as the CVRD to move forward on doing something in all of these areas of risk. And then in terms of what actually makes sense for each individual community, it's much more complex for that than that. There are always trade-offs. And so if you look at this little graphic here, you don't really need to look at details of it, but understand that green is good and red is bad. And that we're looking at different options in the columns and different uh, criteria and the rows. And you'll see for each option that some things are good and some things are bad. So it's always going to be a tough choice to be made. There's always probably gonna be a winner and a loser. And so it's about working together to ensure that, you know, at aggregate, you're choosing the best option. And so in this particular case, um, the, the idea of strengthening the village, which is a sort of resilience based idea. So it's not about um, big, big decisions or big ideas. It's about sort of picking up the problem by um, increasing the resilience of the community by increasing the strength of the community through community um, activities and recognizing the need to work collectively. So, I mean, quite is it intangible in terms of what it actually looks like, which is very challenging when you're going to the public to try and explain these things or, or even to other folks in terms of getting funding for these things. But I think it was clear that there was definitely a willingness to sort of try out some of these softer ideas. So key takeaways um, from this process uh, was that there was, like I just said, really a strong takeaway for us that there is a desire for the community to build in resilience. So that's about really making sure you recover faster after an event by investing in education, so public education, communication, dialogue, continuing to have these conversations as stakeholders, but also as the public. Another key takeaway was definitely the need to engage and bring in some of the other jurisdictional partners. So it was a we were we did we did um, work with them. They were partners in some of the project, but we didn't we weren't able to bring everybody into the room in every meeting. And not everybody's working at the same pace uh, with the same urgency, and so that was a bit of a challenge. So moving forward, especially in some areas uh, around Comox and Courtney there is a need to take much more of a coordinated approach and bring everybody to the table with the same goals. Um, there's definitely a need to move forward and think about preparing yourselves for some really tough decisions going forward. Uh, there's always trade-offs. There's gonna be people who are gonna be unhappy with some of the decisions that will have to be made. Um, but that's something that if you're ready for and you have all of the backing in terms of a transparent process and all the information to support that, it should be relatively relatively painless, I guess, or, or more or less, less painful um, than it would be if you just tried to hit some of these decisions straight on equity again. Another big takeaway was that there was definitely a recognition that keeping uh, options open into the future in terms of being able to constantly adapt uh, the ideas depending on what's happening with climate or um, economy or whatever else is going on in the world and making sure that the options that are being put in place today aren't uh, getting us stuck in an entrenched pathway. So for example, going forward with some of the hard infrastructure components means that we kind of, you're stuck with that solution in, to, in, the, in perpetuity. Um, so recognizing that that's not the way forward. Um, we certainly heard that from our small group discussions. The other thing was that, especially with the resilience lens, there's definitely an opportunity to start small and grow with time. So don't think of this as something an impossible challenge to face, that there's some really small, easy things to do in the short term around engagement and education um, that will support resilience. Um, and then in future, you could start working up to these more difficult decisions. The other big takeaway is that there was a recognition that we needed to have lots of eggs in our basket, lots of different ways to approach this, and that it's there's, there's, there's things that we can draw from these big power um, adaptation types um, to bring together into an individual community to develop a, a solution that's best for them. 
Like I said at the outset, we certainly heard um, from the values piece of the work that we did that nature is really important at the core of why many people live in your, in your region. Um, and therefore nature-based solutions should be prioritized going forward as much as possible. And the third thing that we certainly heard was that there was definitely a need for an all of society approach to this problem so that the responsibility doesn't just lie with government and CBRD and others like yourselves, but that it, 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 it lies with everybody um, to act and individuals in their own homes to act and make changes that will support their resilience as well as working with their neighbors or community groups, et cetera. And also uh, recognizing that uh, sort of large asset holders and uh, landowners and these types of people also need to be engaged in these conversations because it's only gonna work if we sort of work together, but also recognize that everybody has their, their place to do something. So very quickly, next steps, um, Robin's already gone over them. Um, there are, I can't remember how many recommendations, but there's pages and pages and pages of them in the big report. Don't recommend you read that. Um, if you read the short report, you'll see that we've got some immediate next steps. One is to start delving into the pub public realm, so start um, engaging with the public on these issues. Uh, we obviously started that with our public information session in um, November, which was very well attended, um, probably in part thanks to floodwaters being on the ground elsewhere in the province, but it was a really uh, engaging um, event and uh, we developed some resources as well that were put on the website afterwards. But there's definitely room to improve that. So keep growing that public engagement. The other key piece I think moving forward is recognizing the need to actually have some kind of paperwork uh, to get an MOU um, agreement in place with your other partners in the region. So the, um, the Comox First Nation uh, first and foremost, but also the city of Comox and the city of, or town of Comox and the city of Courtney, um, as well as other key uh, um, players in the region like MOTI. So there's a definitely a need, I think, to get everybody on the same page, working towards the same type of goals. And I think that's the type of thing that um, often gets left to the wayside. And so we're having all of these side conversations rather than working together. Um, but it's also a lot of work to have staff uh, reach out and spend time uh, strengthening the relationships that they already have with these other players. Um, but it's something that's gonna be really important going forward. Um, and specifically, we have suggested that a uh, decision process uh, like the one we did for Saratoga, but specifically designed for Comox Road area um, take place next. Um, that this would sort of basically require that MOU piece to be in place. That'd be a really excellent opportunity to, to explore a totally different area than Saratoga in terms of what's there. It's agricultural land as well as quite a lot of linear infrastructure. Um, and also would require that everybody else comes to the table, D and D and all of these folks. So I think this is this is what we're hoping for that you get your grant and you're able to move forward with that kind of process. And that is it. For me, apologies if that was too fast or too short. You can read. Well, I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. I'm sure. So thanks. All right. I'm ready. All right, <laughs> Director Arbor. Thank you, and a lot of updates since uh, we last saw you. I guess that was before the holidays that we did the sessions, and they were really good. Uh, there's a lot to ponder on on this topic. Um, one of which is outside of the grants that we're currently funding, if we agree that doing nothing is not a great option, although it's often favored. <laughs> um, you know, the question is, um, how will this live at the regional district? And in other topics, we always have the conversation around what service will this live under? And is this gonna live under the RGS or are we going to come next term and propose a climate transition service for the rural areas or for everybody or what? And I guess in the short term, we're having this live here under long-term planning in the RGS, but there's lots of questions because if you start looking at actual implementation on the ground and infrastructure or the types of decisions, you know, the question is to who's going to pay for this if we run out of grants, which we will. You know, um, will it be the homeowners that are affected? Will it be the broader community? There'll be a lot of questions that'll come up. Um, 
And, um, and it's on that basis that I, I really like your, your tasks, but I'm not sure I agree with the third one. It's new, you know, as of this weekend, I hadn't thought about Comox Road. But for me, as we contemplate a brand new field, um, picking a project that requires multi-jurisdictional um, approach in something that is brand new and something that has some history on the active transportation side that didn't quite result in where we wanted to be in regards to Comox Road. Uh, we had a multi-stakeholder process around that and we didn't really unlock unlock it. That does, I, I want to, what I'm trying to say, let's be more positive than that comment. What I'm trying to say is I want to see early successes, right? So I want us to start on the climate transition and have projects that are well-defined and work and we can show to the public. And um, it seems to me that having multiple jurisdictions involved brings more risks to those early successes though if you achieve them then you're a hero it's like oh we've paved the way for the future but if you were going to ask me you know ship's point great you know let's uh, that's one jurisdiction you got the rural areas committee which you know has really helped fund all of this work um you you have a lot less complexity uh, around this and all you have is really the ministry of transportation to deal with and ourselves and the community. Um, so a bit like you did with Saratoga. And Saratoga is, 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 is starting, right? We're not, we haven't provided like hard solutions yet. We haven't uh, achieved, you know, we've achieved engagement with what we haven't. So th that, that'd be my only comment. It'd be top of mind that I would hate for us to jump into a big regional project and then for political reason or staff reason or et cetera, et cetera, that, you know, that the project doesn't fly and we can't agree. And, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of my, my feedback, but this said, I've got an open mind. Maybe, maybe, maybe the stars are aligned on this one. I would need to, to learn more. Does, Back to you, Chair. Do staff want to comment? Were there any other um, factors in choosing Comox Road? I'm, I'm thinking sewage conveyance may have come into to play. Um, through the chair, I can comment on that. This area was identified as having um, been greatly impacted through the mapping exercise. And when looking at which area to focus on as a, as a case study, this area was highlighted just because of its complexity and recognizing that it would need, um, it would need to be its own project. And so other areas like Saratoga Beach or Ships Point, they could be looked at um, a, a bit more bird's eye because we because it's simpler because we are the only jurisdiction. So recognizing that we would need um, funding and we would need that collaborative governance framework in place, Comox Road was suggested as being our next um, our next project area to really focus on. Just recognizing its significance with as a as a transportation corridor um, because of the sewer conveyance and because of all the uh, projects that are are happening and at this time. So it was looked at as being um, an opportunity to really explore the decision making process further. If I don't know, for Tamson, do you have any more that you wanted to comment on? Perhaps the risk assessment. Mm, yeah. So I could just briefly say, I mean, we didn't choose it because it's the hardest, because uh, you're right, <laughs> it's not necessarily the right place to start. We chose it because it was the most uh, necessary uh, next step in terms of the high risk in the region. Um, it's There's a lot of flood, I mean, you, you, it, it, it's, it's there now, right? So I think that it's something that's experienced um, every year already, and that is going to get potentially worse. And so it's, it's, it's a necessary thing to work on because of the high risk associated with the site. And then, Next to that, of course, is the strategic um, consideration that there are things underway in that area already that may lock down in terms of an entrenched pathway um, if decisions are made related to the road or the other major this the other lines that are going in there. Um, there is potential that those things will um, yeah lock us into a into a pathway, and so there's definitely sort of a, definitely a need by and I, to to move forward. Um, in that area fairly soon um, because of the high risk and potentially a need to do that 
um, quite soon just to ensure that there's alignment with these other projects that are going in. Um, and I would, I mean, I, I, I'm sure the engineering department is all over making sure that whatever is going in there is adaptable into the future, but just it, it would be important uh, to look at this from a, a coastal flood adaptation lens rather than just an engineering lens. That, that's really useful uh, additional information on why, and that makes sense, you know, that, that that is a high risk. Some of the other parts. So I think before, you know, confirming those as NASAS, you should probably come back and have engineering and other people kind of come and talk about conceptually what that could look like, because I'm not sure if this would just be an add-on in the sense that we put a climate um, piece um, that gets added to those projects, or whether this would be a transformative thing where, oh, we have to reopen the LWMP process and change the location of the sewage line, which then everybody's going to freak out. I don't think that will be like that, but um, you know, it, it'd be interesting before we lock in to that as a priority in relation to others that you know we have a little more information as to what the scope could be. Um, because my concern still remains, even though all your answers are totally on point and valid, I agree if it's a high risk and we have more floods, but I think my comment was still valid as well, that I, I would hate for something to uh, be either a little bit frivolous on, on the side as a climate thing when you have all these other drivers in play, or else that actually we're too ambitious and then it fails. And then what does that say about climate, um, the climate action? Okay. Director Grief. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I remember we had this discussion at the fire hall uh, quite a few years back now, and some of the property owners up at uh, Oyster River uh, kind of accused me of fear-mongering and were quite concerned this was going to affect their insurance <laughs> or their ability to get insurance. But... Um, we have a duty to warn and a duty to inform, I guess, more than anything else here. And to, to get this, this conversation uh, out there in the public so that, you know, at least everybody's aware of it. That being said, rather than preemptive, uh, we're gonna be probably responding to emergency, emergencies more than, than trying to prevent them, obviously. Um, emergency intervention. Um, you mentioned uh, the dike. Well, you probably know that the dike has been there since 1908. And uh, they've experienced flooding since 1908. Um, in fact, it wasn't, uh, it was a, the very last time that they, uh, they originally had a causeway. <laughs> you can see the remnants of even today coming, going from the old field sawmill site uh, across that stretch where we have the floodgates there now. But, um, you know, it, it's the people in that area have been flooded out before. In fact, Scott Road on the dike. Um, I remember uh, visiting my future wife there by canoe because we had a Boxing Day flood that flooded the whole thing. So it's not really new. <clears throat> that being said, people tend to forget about things and time goes on and then it happens again. So, you know, it's... Um, it's obviously not something that we're going to be uh, actively working on on the preventative side because uh, we don't really know what's coming around that corner. That being said, um, at least we're forearmed and forewarned on, on these issues. And as time goes by, it's, it's going to become, as they say, you know, the, the hundred year flood is happening every 20 years, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's good to keep it in the public. I think the education piece is really important. Having, having all this information available is really important. But um, in so far as actions, I, we've already done what we can up at the Saratoga area with regard to our uh, zoning along Clarkson Drive, where we have looked towards, uh, you know, um, an organized retreat from from the foreshore. So, it, and we made the zoning so that uh, people on the other side, on the up 
um, upland side of, of the parks and drive have the opportunity to apply for TC1 zoning, not apply for it. I think they have the opportunity to change it to TC1 zoning. You know, in, in anticipation of the other side of the road becoming part of the beach. So I don't know. Um, this all good information as far as, uh, you know, any concrete steps go. I think uh, uh, a, a little story. Um, Andrew Weaver was uh, in Victoria for the Green Party uh, when I was tasked by UBCM. Um, on advocacy days in February a few a uh, few years ago, I was tasked on presenting uh, our policy on uh, on uh, climate change mitigation. So I went in there with my my speaking notes uh, when we we all visited different MPs and and our MLAs and different uh, cabinet ministers. I was assigned uh, Andrew Weaver. I went in there and I said, "Yes, I'm here to uh, to advocate on behalf of mitigation of climate change." Well, that was just exactly the wrong thing to say to him. He literally hit the ceiling. How can you mitigate against a three degree warming of the climate? Yeah, there's no mitigation against that. This hasn't been like that since the the dinosaurs, and 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 that was the end of the conversation. So I just sat there for twenty minutes and nodded, you know, and so. So that was that wasn't too effective, but you know that when it comes right down to it, local government, we have to deal with the effects on the ground, right? We're the, we're the people that are there. So, you know, they, these are our neighbors, these are our friends, these are you know the parents of the kids that our kids or grandkids play with. So you know it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a tough slog for us because we we lack the uh, first of all we lack the authority over the foreshore. Uh, second of all, um, we we don't have a hell of a lot of money to play with, and are totally reliant on senior government grants. And the more I do this job, the more I realize it's just we're sort of just a, a glorified nonprofit society that has to go for grant funding to do anything anyway, with a little bit of taxation on the side. So I, I don't know. Um, this is all going to do in good stead. This is going to be good uh, resource material when we go out to, in the public. I think the the smart thing for us to do is to make it all available to raise the awareness. And I think uh, it's people aren't going to take action until they actually see it with their own eyes, right? It's not until you know that uh, that ditch overflows and uh, and your your basement floods that it suddenly rings a bell up there that you know maybe this is something we have to deal with. But I I don't know. Uh, and so far as local government goes, you know I think we did the right thing in, on in doing all this, but. Um, you know, how are we effective? We're there to inform. We're there to warn. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Breed. Um, Tom, didn't you, a few questions for me. Um, um, and maybe also, this is also for staff. You know, you were mentioning a grant um, moving forward to do some of this work. Has that um, application already gone in? And if so, when might we hear from, from the, the funders? <laughs> Through the chair, uh, staff submitted the application at the end of January, and we are expecting a response probably mid-year at this point, um, which is why the uh, next steps have been um, essentially oriented the way they have. If we are successful, we would be able to undertake all three of the priority actions. If we are unsuccessful, we have uh, allocated enough uh, budget to be able to undertake the first two actions. Okay. Um, it sounded like um, having a multi-jurisdictional project um, would maybe bump up our application a bit higher. Can you comment too? Is, was that something that uh, you purposely moved forward? In, in TAC, through the chair, Intact Foundation is a bit of a new uh, program. We've never applied uh, to this before. It's a brand new program. It's, I believe it's an insurance provider. Uh, and I don't believe there was any additional um, points given for a multi-jurisdictional application. It was, it was merely uh, scoped um, through this work that we identified that it would be 
quite beneficial to to look at Comox Road from a from a collaborative governance framework. Great, thank you. Um, uh, just my last question is to Tamton. I'm you know I'm looking at um, the table of adaptation strategies and the descriptions around you know staying put, dancing out of the way, putting raincoats on. Um, and I noted that strengthening the village scored, you know, very highly in most of the um, the scenarios. Um, but I, I do have a question around. Um, it seemed to, in some ways, um, download some of the responsibility of like education and actual change on the the person or the the landowner. And um, Tamsin, you've just brought up equity. And so I'm kind of, I'm concerned that, you know, if we really follow that route primarily, and I know, you know, we, we did say having a number of eggs in different baskets, that that route seemed to put a lot of emphasis on the homeowner, having the capacity and the resources to be able to make change. Do you want to comment on, on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you picked up the problem like that. I mean, every one of these things, these, these options that we presented, we presented some of the, the tensions in terms of the trade-offs between them, but it's been highly simplified down into those, those criteria, right? And one thing we didn't get into those criteria was the issue of equity because we sort of heard that later on in the process and weren't able to include it, nor do we have a good mechanism to really include that in terms of a score. So it's probable that that strengthening the village one would score poorly on equity because it relies so much on the individual actions. And so I think that's something that you would have to be aware of. And we've provided some, um, some recommendations in our the lengthy report in terms of new criteria and things that we missed in, in this round. So the idea there was that we tested out these criteria, here are some positives, here are some failings, and here's what we would do next time where you should consider in your next round to make sure that you're including those things. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I mean, we, we, we try to have four different adaptation option packages that were quite distinct from each other to support the engagement and support those conversations. So we did have that, that sort of extreme example of resilience, which was really, yeah, individuals action. There was some collective action around working together at a neighborhood level, but it was all about, uh, teasing out some of the some of the issues with them. And I, I agree, I think that all of these options are going to face challenges if um, yeah, around equity. Even if it's government led, there are going to be equity issues because of you're always going to a super simple example because it's easy to understand. Like if you're putting a dike in place, you're immediately protecting some people and not protecting others. So you're still making that decision and creating issues of equity. And if we look at First Nations across BC, you'll see very quickly that those decisions have created worse scenarios and have, had, have exacerbated the problem. So even if it's government-led, there's, a, there's a, a risk of that occurring. So it's important moving forward in all of these areas to try and bring this really holistic lens to any decision-making, um, which makes it very complex and much more difficult to move forward because you are trying to sort of work in those very messy spaces. So I commend, I commend you and your and the CBRD for sort of allowing us to do this kind of process. It's, it's not common um, across the province of BC. We've done this maybe, I don't know, four or five times. 99% of the projects uh, related to this type of work go through a cost benefit, much more simple, but really missing out on all of these very important pieces that you've identified here. Okay, well, that's great to hear. I, I did really enjoy the process in the meetings that I was at. Um, one last question to staff. I, you know, I note the role of our emergency preparedness and emergency services in a, around, you know, coastal flooding. And I'm wondering if there's some kind of synergy. I know we are, um, our staff person who's in charge of um, neighborhood emergency plans is probably crafting, you know, their work plan of what neighborhoods to work with. Is there any kind of alignment with these particular neighborhoods being high risk as they are? Uh, and if not, can there be? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll just uh, refer to Doug DeBarso, a general manager of community services who oversees the emergency program to comment on that. Thank you, and through the chair, our current focus, focus on the neighborhood emergency preparedness program is really about revitalizing the old neighborhoods that have showed 
interest in the past. So that's our objectives for 2022. But moving forward, we'll, we'll consider to look at other risk neighborhoods and understand that those impacts. So flood, as, as well as the Oyster River area, would, would probably rise close to the top. So yeah, we definitely look at that moving forward. But 2022 is largely focused on just reinvigorating what was in place. So I'm not sure where all those locations were. Be happy to send you a list after this meeting. But uh, well, if there is room for Comox Road, I mean, it seems it would it would seem like a, a missed opportunity since those residents are going to have to come together to discuss, you know, opportunities and and pathways forward. Um, and since they're already there, um, having the emergency preparedness as part of that um, just seems like uh, yeah a missed opportunity. So if that neighborhood can be highlighted for 2022, um, I think that would make a lot of sense moving forward. Director Arbor. Yeah, that's right along the lines of the comments I was going to make, and um, it's okay, Doug. Yeah, I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> um, Speaking of equity, that I'll crack my one joke of the day. I, I think it's very unfair that you know we're only looking to strengthen the village of Cumberland, and we're ignoring uh -huh. the town and the city and strengthening those. Uh, no laughs at all. So, in terms of next steps, yeah, um, it seems to me like if we were gonna, because one of the things I think we have to weigh into the future, because we don't have our climate transition service or our climate adaptation service is exactly what Chair Amir was talking about, is weighing different types of risks as well. Because on the climate, like this grant and this um, project is really focused on coastal flood adaptation, but I think we also have to bear in mind the other three types of uh, risks brought about by climate change. So heat waves, atmospheric rivers, and fire. fire. And fire, thank you, especially on the Gulf Islands. Yes, right? So those are the, the four. You have your coastal flood. And so right now we're looking at it as an optic of coastal flood, but is coastal flood more risky and more important of us devoting resources to those other three? And that's where that alignment with emergency services that Jeremy is talking about and really for staff to start thinking about, and this is a multi-year exercise, to start thinking about how we're truly going to organize around all of this work to prioritize and invest resources in it and seek funding. Because, you know, say that, obviously, everyone knows about, let's take the heat waves, right? We're starting little programs around that, but you may not get a flood at the Comox Road for... 10 or 15 years, but you may get like eight years of heat wave. So would we want to start with the heat wave tackling, right? So that, I guess what I heard uh, Damon said earlier is like, I hate to boil that. And I don't want us to do that. That's very um, simplistic, but that cost benefit analysis. So we're going to reinvest resources because there's going to be demands all over the map. But as we start going down those roads and as we start seeking federal and provincial partners you know what will be our focuses are we with will, will we let those different things all live in the, the different little areas and you know seeking their own opportunity or do we want to set and say okay you know what this is going to be very expensive to municipalities we talk about it at fcm all the time so how do we organize around all this work and the different types of needs that our our communities are going to face that's a big question to me. And, and is the right time to ask it because you've done enough to present us with the coastal flood that we were starting to understand. Like if I look two years ago, I had no idea. I mean, I know, <laughs> but because we did this work in, in some ways it's reassuring. Information is reassuring. You know, you, you start to, okay, now I can wrap my head around it at the neighborhood level, but does it mean it's still going to be the key climate priority in relation to others is one of my questions. But thank you. It's amazing work. I think um, the whole process has been excellent. The reports are excellent. It's great. Thank you. Tamsin, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. I, I think you've had experience both in coastal flooding and, you know, in the Fraser Valley with the atmospheric river, um, sort of tr 
trying to juggle what the risks are and, and what regional districts where they put their, their the few dollars and eggs that they mm. do have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's, it's a super important thing to consider because you don't want to be in a state where you have maladaptation, right? Where you're chasing one thing and that actually makes things worse for another another climate risk. I, 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 I do want to um, rain on your parade, though, um, Director Arbor, and suggest that there aren't only four bad things that are coming your way, but it's more like 20 or 30. In fact, we have a list of 83, I think, in our office. Um, but you've hit the big one, so that's what's important. But I think, yeah, I think moving forward, I think the, the challenge, of course, for local governments is that you're constantly chasing grants, and those grants are often um, specific to individual um, types of hazard. I do think and I do hope and maybe know something that future granting opportunities for the province and others will hopefully open the door to looking at all hazards and a much bigger sort of climate lens. And then I think the other thing to consider is that some of the options that we um, included as part of the process in Saratoga Beach would work better for all of these different hazards. And so that's probably another criteria that should be on those lists that we develop to say something like strengthening in the village is going to support um, resilience across many, many different hazards. Whereas some of the sort of the, the I can't remember what we call it, some of the other options, putting on raincoats, for example, is much more flood specific. So I think there is an opportunity moving forward to embed a little bit of those other uh, um, hazards into these, these kind of projects if the granting programs are the only way forward. But I would encourage you as a CVRD to consider doing a climate risk uh, assessment and it could be quite you know, desktop-y and high level to identify uh, the other hazards that might be of concern and then where there's, where they're gonna, where there's gonna be maladaptations um, that you need to start thinking about. But it's, it's a super important point that you don't wanna waste all your money on one thing when something else might actually be riskier. Thank you. Um, before we vote on receipt, I just wanted to ask staff, um, we had an earlier um, comment about um, possible by looking at our bylaws through that climate lens around um, building height when it comes to uh, building for flood and having the extra you know, um, developments on, on piers. Um, when it comes to recommendation time, um, would you like a separate recommendation for that? Or is that something like that kind of wound up in, in what's here? Thank you very much. And Alana Mullaly, General Manager of Planning and Development is here to provide a response. Thanks, Russell. <clears throat> Excuse me, through Madam Chair to the directors. I think, you know, generally, um, Robin and I have been talking about a number of implementation pieces and certainly looking at um, all of the tools, the regulatory tools that we have falls into this. If you're looking for something within a specific time frame, then perhaps a separate direction is warranted. Otherwise, generally know that through um, implementation, we'll have to look at the regulatory piece. Okay. No, I wasn't looking at a time frame unless any of the direct other directors were in their degree. Oh, just the same old, same old. Um, you know, local government's designed to do things that have direct impact on the residents. We're designed for garbage collection, water, sewer services, uh, building uh, permits and regulation, all that stuff. So every time they, they heap another thing on our plate, as I say, then we have to look to senior government for funding. It occurs to me, and FCM knows this very well, is that uh, this should be a federal priority and secondary, a provincial priority. Here we are operating on seven cents on the tax dollar, and it, it ends up in our lap. Not to say that we don't have to deal, as I say, with the, with the people on the street, because we're the closest, to, closest government to the people. And as such, you know, we have a, we have a duty to, uh, to at least be seen as taking a, a lot of this, you know, this to heart. But the way I see it in reality, um, we're going to be mostly reactive as things come up. Like what is going to be the greatest risk? I would think the greatest risk to uh, to property and, and and life would probably be wildfires, especially with the the way the forests are drying out nowadays. People by the beach, I mean, you built there, right? You have a little bit of an idea what's going on. 
Um, I just, you know, I, I don't see this as being a, a big ticket item for the taxpayer, the local government taxpayers, the property owners that pay the tax. You know, they obviously we've got the resources here. We're going to make that available. We're going to stress the education and we're going to incorporate in some of our zoning bylaws, you know, how to, how to deal with uh, sea level rise. But um, as I say, it's, it's really should be something that lands on the plate of senior government because it's, it's worldwide. In fact, it should be landing on the plate of world government if there's such a thing out there. So, you know, rather than getting too into the minutia here, I think we have to take the big broad overview on what we can do with a limited amount of dollars that we have. And, and I think it's gonna be steered according to what comes next. What's the next thing? Is it gonna be an earthquake? Wildfire? Is uh, Comox Lake suddenly gonna overflow its banks and flood Cumberland? Just saying. Director Gray. I'm oh, sorry, Director Arvin. Yeah, I would take just a slight different view on that, maybe more optimistic in the sense that I think the federal and provincial governments are at the table with meaningful dollars, but they need us to define our needs and we can influence the type of programs that they put out. They, they rely on us, as you know well, the view from Ottawa is Ottawa-centric. They need the input of communities in terms of what we want to do and how we want to address things. And I've said, and I know you've been on the FCM board as well. I think FCM is quite effective at, at, at pitching to the feds um, to put programs out there that will uh, really partner us up as different orders of government. So I'm, I'm actually not hopeful on the climate front right now that uh, we can align all the different interests. But I think you're also right that in some instances, it goes back to, I'm starting to sound like staff, but <laughs> this goes back to how we organize around the work too, right? So when Chair Amir yourself say, you know, the, wa the waterfront, maybe it's just the people living there. If they need to, to do something, they pay into it or, or like the mosquito service or something. At the broader level, we all contribute to the emergency services. But yeah, I would go back to the, in the next year or two, trying to figure out how we move from a kind of grant dependent to us setting the tone, right? So saying this is, and again, say that you start a, a climate transition service, even if it's just for the rural areas and the municipalities don't want it, what does that look like? Would it be very broad? Would it be very narrow? Would it just answer specific needs as they arise, as you state? Or would it be preemptive? Would there be appetite from the population to be preemptive? Maybe not. We are right. Human nature is, you know, we discount the discount rate of the future is pretty high. So, um, but I think those questions would be great to explore. And I don't think we'll be able to, I do agree that doing nothing, that's not why I'm in politics. I think it's easy when you said, you know, it's good to be seen. I don't want to be seen. I want to help solve things. You know, I think climate is going to be a reality, and that's what our children and grandchildren are expecting us to do right now, is to set up the frameworks and the mechanisms to address the very challenging um, risks that are coming down the pipe. So anyways, I'll, I'll advocate for that, for sure. Thanks. Uh, I'm not going to um, recommend any further recommendations other than what's presented to us. Um, I think the framework that's probably going to be de developed on working on, on the Comox Road project is probably going to inform so much more uh, beyond. And so I think it's a great first step. And hopefully we get the, the funding and we're able to do three projects. Um, so I don't think we voted on receipt. All, all in favor of receipt? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. And we have a recommendation. I can move it. Seconded. Thank you, Director Arbor. Um, anyone have comments on, on the recommendation? Yeah, go ahead, Director Arbor. Yeah, I, I just like to reiterate, I'll vote in favor, but I would really like to see something early to the rural areas because we're going to be the initiators and before we approach the other partners that the rural area director is already comfortable and have a, a thorough discussion around what the project might look like and how it's pitched. 
Um, go ahead, um, Robin. Through Madam Chair, I would just like to say that staff can report back with a detailed scoping report that would help give you an idea of what that project will look like. As well, we will be proposing a climate risk lens. Great, thank you. Uh, Director Grief, did you have a comment? Uh, just simply, how much money do we have left? In this service or in? This isn't a service, right? No. Nope. In the grant? The grant is it, right? There's no tax requisition attached at this point. Thank you. Okay, comments are done. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Um, would folks like to break for lunch now? Working lunch? We'll have a working lunch, uh, 15 minutes, if that's okay. There's a lot of people waiting. Yeah, I know, there's sorry, there's lots of folks, but they can grab lunch too. Mm -hmm. Who's that season?
Okay, I'll call the meeting back to order. We are at item number nine, bylaw enforcement annual report for receipt. Okay. We've been seconded over to staff. Thank you very much. And Amanda Yasinski is here to present her report and answer any of your questions with respect to the annual report on bylaw. Thanks, Amanda. Welcome. Good afternoon through the CAO to the chair. So this report provides an overview for all bylaw enforcement activities in 2021. It seems so long ago now. I just wanted to say this was based on our previous um, prior to this financial uh, year, the services house, they were established and how we set up tracking um, prior to rolling and having the Dem and Hornby Island function separate from, so moving forward, um, we'll endeavor to capture each services um, enforcement activity. So this is from, from last year. A total of 48 municipal tickets or MTIs were issued in 2021, which resulted in 51 $198 in fines being paid, paid towards tickets issued for building, animal control, noise, unsightly premise, and watering infractions. Additionally, through provincial court prosecutions that the CVRD undertook on three properties owned by Mr. Santos, a total of $42,500 in fines were awarded by the courts and were paid to the CVRD. These fine amounts were broken down from building infractions, zoning, and unsightly premise. And the fine amounts that were received were divided up into each respective service and helped to offset the legal fees towards that file. In 2021, the CSWM illegal dumping program received 58 reports of legal dump sites. These sites are logged and identified by bylaw staff who conduct any necessary enforcement follow-up and work with participating jurisdictions as required. Please note that a more fulsome report on the 2021 illegal dumping and enforcement activities will be presented by bylaw staff at the March 17th CSWM board meeting. 2021 was a very busy year for animal control contractors who conducted a total of 1,159 patrols throughout CVRD parks. This was a request from 2020 to have more presence in our parks. Water enforcement was taken on by bylaw staff in 2021 as well. This was a new role for staff who conducted a total of 128 patrols, issuing 99 warning notices and two municipal tickets. As well in 2021, the CVRD's bylaw adjudication system was implemented. We rolled that out December 1st, 2021, and no adjudication tickets were issued. However, early in 2022, the program was working well, um, already hugely beneficial with a handful of uh, adjudication tickets issued, at least five to date. These have been for building and animal control violations with in-house training now completed with our animal control officers, building officials, and fire chiefs. Some specific statistics for 2021, there were a total of 280 new files generated for bylaw enforcement, an increase of 28 files over 2020. Of these, the largest number of files referred to zoning use with 57 new files opened. During this period, there was 279 files closed and staff fielded a total of 733 calls related to specific enforcement files and 730 calls related to general enforcement questions or inquiries. 56 of those inquiries were related specifically to COVID-19 and enforcement of public health orders and regional districts involvement or role. Over 850 um, pieces of correspondence were generated and forwarded by bylaw staff. This would have been um, acknowledgement letters, warning letters, uh, follow-up letters and emails relating to files. Some notable successes for CVRD animal control were 1,025 dog licenses sold in 2021. It's a very slight increase over 2020, hoping to increase that every year. Uh, as well as CVRD animal control officers investigated 67 barking complaints, 16 aggressive dogs, and 170 incidents reported of dogs at large. So the graphs attached to this report depict a breakdown of the files um, overall and then into each electoral area. I just want to note up 
um, other, where we designate other on the graphs for each area. This is capturing, uh, there's a huge increase in other for 2021. These are capturing our enforcement uh, for water patrols. So I need to rename those for this year. That's that bump and other. There's nothing else um, new in there that we're getting calls on. And there's also agency requests in there. Um, notably, I know for area A, particularly in Denman and Hornby, the agency requests were any time staff attended and maybe took photographs or assisted our CMP. We had a lot of RVs residing on um, road accesses, Ministry of Transportation, um, road right of ways, that type of thing throughout the summer. And I can answer any questions on enforcement uh, throughout this report as, as well. Thanks, Amanda. Any questions from directors? Doesn't look like it. Thank you so much. I'm always good to hear what the stats are. Um, and I'll be interested to see how that other section, how, uh -huh. how it progresses. <laughs> All right, so on receipt then, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried, there's no recommendation. Moving on, we've got the active transportation grant for 2022 for receipt. Moved and seconded, and over to staff. Thank you very much. And Mark Hart is here, Parks Planner, to, uh, to present this report and answer any of your questions. Thanks for waiting, Mark. And my... Hold on. So uh, thank you, committee, through the chair. Um, here to talk to you about some active transportation funding that we're looking at in the Parks Department. Um, specifically, two, uh, two grant opportunities this year through the federal government and the provincial government. And we'll see if I can figure this out. Oh, yes. Uh, so we're recommending that you, uh, that the committee through the chair uh, gives us permission, staff permission, to apply for these two uh, grant opportunities for two high priority active transportation projects. Uh, specifically the Lazo Greenway Trail and the Demon Island Cross Island Trail. Um, so as I said, there's two grant opportunities. Uh, the, the, the new one, the one through the federal government through Infrastructure Canada is um, first time available this year and funds up to 60% of total project costs uh, with some obvious um, uh, restrictions on what constitutes an active transportation project. Uh, the application deadlines are for, for this project are for, or for this grant program are, are March 31st. And then there's also the, the province uh, fund, which we've had great success with in the past. And uh, it hasn't yet opened, but we expect it should open this summer. And it provides up to 70% of project costs um, based on a number of things, but most importantly to us, uh, population size. Uh, so I mentioned there were two projects. I suspect um, that you're all familiar with the two projects. I'll just go over them really quickly. Uh, the Lazo Greenway Trail project is a collaboration between the CVRD and, and the town of Comox. It's a two and a half kilometer trail going from Butcher Road to uh, Sam Pines Crescent. Um, it was identified in the active transportation network plan as a, as a high priority project for us. Uh, and we currently have $250,000 um, budgeted for it for this year, uh, but the entire project should cost about 1.9 million. Uh, so this, these grant opportunities will help us get this project done. Um, and if we're successful in both, we can cover up to up to 84% of the total project cost. And then the remainder would be shared between us and the town of Comox, 50-50. Um, the, the other project, which you may even be more familiar with, is the Cross Island Trail on Demon Island. Um, th this uh, extension to that trail will not complete the trail, but but take us a long way towards completing that trail with a few challenging pieces that remain and we'll need some work with Moti. Uh, but generally the, the extension will be a three and a half kilometer extension from Owl Crescent down to the ferry uh, Gravely Bay. Uh, it's identified as a priority in the Demon Island Parks and Greenways Master Plan. And uh, we currently have 30,000 
dollars uh, budgeted for this year uh, for it. The project uh, is expected to cost about 600,000 this year. And, uh, and we expect that we can get about 88% of the total project costs through these funding opportunities, which leaves a, a tiny bit of uncertainty for us. Um, some of the funding for this project will have to either come from a reserve fund or from the community works uh, grant. Uh, so there are a number of options available to you today. We would recommend the first one, which is to allow staff to proceed with applying for these grants for both projects. Um, but of course you're open to, uh, to suggest that we don't proceed at all or that we proceed with one or the other of the two projects. Thank you. Great, thank you. Do directors have any questions of staff? Director Arbor? Yeah, thank you. And I really appreciate staff responsiveness in terms of moving from, well, I guess we didn't really have active transportation grants for the Dem and Trail for quite a few years available, but it's nice to see that we're pursuing grants to do this work and, and trying to leverage our resources. Um, so I, I'm in favor of applying for the Dem and Cross Island Trail for sure. And the Ladsville Greenway from what I know of it as well. Um, I would have a request that, um, or maybe a question is the level of engagement we've done. At, okay, let me reframe. An opportunity around uh, what's really, this trail will be going across the Graham Lake Improvement District uh, area, which engineering knows well, but for us, it's like huh? <laughs> on the park side. But what I'm trying to say is we have two major projects aff affecting residents of that area this year in that we are working towards a transfer of um, the water following successful uh, receipt of a, of a grant. Um, so the improvement district likely to come into the regional district, that's one project. And this other one would be the Cross Island Trail. And I might add, we have a third one, which is um, as of two weeks ago, they are starting to uh, put in or Doing the planning around fiber optic on Denman Island, so they're gonna they're gonna go along the road and uh, start laying the cables in the next. I think the project completion for Denman is in the next three months or something. So that's all coming up really quickly. But what I'm thinking is just the public engagement component. When I think about those three projects, I'm wondering if we should think about organizing a little session and have staff for that neighborhood. There's about a hundred. 20, 140 homes and go over, there could be three things, right? We could go over the, the parks, um, an update on the Cross Island Trail and the grant that we would be submitting. The other maybe update from engineering on the water. And then I don't think we might not need to bring City West, but anyways, just public engagement because um, sometimes I hear some grumblings about them and Cross Island Trail outside of the committee. And, um, and I think it, It'd be easy to just you know give the updates, see if there's community feedback, for people to know we've applied to the grant, if they've got last second requests around certain things that we can consider. So is that, or we can have separate processes for all those. But because I'm dealing with all three, I thought I'd bring it up that you know if we're going to engage the neighborhood, I figure we have to engage them at some point around some of these items. Any feedback from Parks on that, or or what would be the default public engagement? Mark? Yeah, through the chair. Thank you very much, uh, Director Arbor, for that question. Um, yeah, our parks can certainly work on engaging, and I'm wondering if it might be better um, if we if we actually wait until we actually realize the grant or not, because I think with this project, um, we won't be going forward without a grant. So, um, so, so to be engaging the, the public prior to that, I think we might want to wait until after. In that case, can I... I mean, it's always a little bit uh, blurry with the federal and provincial governments with timing of announcements, but um, do you have any insights if the, the funders have provided any insights into uh, the timing of their announcements and their process? So the, the first grant intake for the federal government is March 31st. And, and I'm actually, I don't know, and I don't think they specify the timeline for announcements, but I suspect, although it's not said that it's timed fairly closely to align with the BC 
um, application process. The BC program is designed in such a way so that you can't reach 100% funding for a project. And so you need to know all third party, third party um, options before you can apply. Um, so it will probably be into summer before we know. In, into summer, yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. So then we're all on the same page, and I think that's a, that's a good plan. And tying to our progress conversation, I do know, uh, as per Dr. Grieve, that FCM did some lobbying for the feds to put together an active transportation fund. So there's a good example of local government impacting things. Yes, thank you to all the directors that, that have helped with that kind of lobbying. <clears throat> Director Grieve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, my question is, Originally, um, with the uh, the gas tax, community Canadian community grants funding, um, you could not spend that dollar unless you owned the the infrastructure, the property. Now, has that changed? Is that okay now that we can work with the with the, with trails on MOT right of ways? I know this. I think I think uh, Powell River pushed that envelope about 10 years ago and, and did a trail by the, by the, by the MOTI road, but it, they're allowed to use it now. So we can use that for, for uh, developing and uh, maintaining trails. Yeah. Through the chair. Um, as far as I'm, as far as I know, you can, um, but um, we'll definitely look into that and, and, and make sure of that fact. But I, I do know that you are allowed to use community works funds in support of the um, of um, extra federal or provincial dollars, so it used to be that that yeah, so you can you can stack those dollars, so those those community works funds can be used for that. I don't believe there's anything in there that says it has to be on our land owned by 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 us, but um, but I'll check into that. Thanks. Thanks, um, and just one comment to staff around the Lazo um, portion. Uh, we did have a, a delegation many years back from residents who were talking about safety and sight lines around um, the Butcher's Road, Lazo area. And I'm just wondering if staff could maybe let them know, like um, give them an update. I know we, we don't know for getting the grant for sure, but it'd be nice to just let them know that we've applied and that this is in the works. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. And I don't see any other comments or questions. <clears throat> oh yeah, go ahead, Director Herbert. Yeah, we, we can vote. Can I have it like a two-second update? I can't. My memory can't remember if we heard back about the Hornby boat ramp grant application. <laughs> Did we get declined on that, or it's still being adjudicated? Yeah, through the chair, we've now made two applications, so we've been denied twice on that. Mm. You're up three for another vote. Too bad. Okay, on receipt then. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. We have a recommendation. Moved and seconded that both uh, applications go through. Comments on that? Hearing and seeing none. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Great, thanks. And moving on, the Regional Park Service Background Study for receipt. Uh, oh, you're, you're jumping that back across. road first. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> the back road trail. Uh, Back up, back up. Uh, license of occupation. Thank you for receipt. Moved and seconded, and over to staff. Great, and Mark Harrison will summarize this and uh, answer any of your questions. Sorry, I saw Alan and I got all excited. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Russell. Um, through the chair, this is just for information purposes, but I, I just want to let the uh, the committee know that uh, that CBRD has received um, a thirty year license from Modi with the support of the Comox First Nation um, for the use and the maintenance. Of the newly constructed trail along uh, back road. So um, normally Modi doesn't have the ability to uh, to maintain trail infrastructure. So um, a good kind of partnership um, that was delivered here in terms of working with the Minister of Transportation and the Comox First Nation and the CVRD on this uh, license agreement. Thank you. Fantastic arrangement. I'm seeing lots of nods and smiles around the table, but no questions. All right. On receipt. Our <laughs> receipt. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thanks, Mark. All right. Now, Regional Park Service background study for receipt. Moved, Moved and seconded and over to staff. 
Thanks very much. And Mark Harrison will we'll introduce Alan Nielsen, and together they'll provide a summary and answer any of your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Russell. Um, through the chair, um, like I'm very, uh, very excited to be here at this time to, to kind of bring this forward. Um, we are here to present and to seek feedback on the Regional Parks Background Study and the proposed service framework. Um, just before we get started and before I introduce Alan, I wanted to um, just acknowledge and thank Alan for all his, uh, all his really hard work and dedicated work that he's put forward on this project. And I also want to thank um, all the members of the regional uh, working group. So that was comprised of all the parks managers um, within each of the um, uh, local governments and also uh, Doug as well. And then I also want to thank um, all the CAOs of also all the local governments as well, because all that, that input from the working group, from, from Alan, from the CAOs was um, really taken to heart and um, and provided a lot of significant contribution to this study and to this proposed uh, framework. So thanks to everyone involved. So if I could, if it's possible, if we could just bring up the uh, the slide. So we've got a little slide presentation that, that Alan will be largely presenting. I've just got a couple of slides that I wanna just uh, start with and then uh, and then I'll move it over to, to Alan. So if we could move to, the second slide. Lisa needs just a second. Thanks. So it's just to start off, just a little bit about you know how how we got here, and um, you know I, I I believe that most of the people here at the table here realize that we've got a challenging model currently with the regional district um, and with the municipalities on how we can go forward with protecting regionally significant areas. The, um, the Comox Strathcona Regional District, like the, we did have originally a regional park service that was established in 1971, and then it basically became dormant in 1998. And then in 2008, when the, when the, when the Strath, Comox Strathcona Regional District got disbanded, dissolved, and then the CVRD just um, became its own regional district, um, we ended up with this regional district that was quite a bit smaller than that, the original Comox Strathcona regional district. So I think just in terms of geographical size, I think we're dealing with a, with a completely different situation here in terms of this service uh, than we had historically. And then obviously in 2008, there was a lot of documents just started to come out through this regional district in support of collaboration. So I'm thinking about things like Nature Without Borders in 2008 that talked about um, the willingness or, or desire for us to look at collaboration for um, conservation areas in our area. There was the uh, Comox Valley Sustainability Strategy in 2010 that talked about trying to look at jointly acquiring lands to meet park needs through the electoral areas and in, within mis municipalities. And then obviously the regional growth strategy, which talks all about collaboration. So I think um, that idea that collectively we can achieve more is it is out there and is, is pretty foundational right now. I think with uh, with COVID, um, we've all seen there's that heightened pressure um, on our, our park systems um, within our electoral areas, but also within the local government park systems as well. So we really are at or exceeding our, our carrying capacity. Um, and then just before we kind of move on, I just want to point out that this regional service is really there to complement our existing services. We're not um, looking to um, take over any other existing services. This would be something that would be a standalone service. On to the next one. So in two, December of 2020, we, uh, the board gave us direction to begin a three step process to explore our regional parks service within the Comox Valley Regional District. So we are just finishing up step one that you see on this process slide, which was the collaborative background study and then a general direction for the service, which is the proposed um, framework. So the idea is that this proposed background study and framework would be presented to each of those local governments uh, to seek feedback and then we'd be reporting back to the board to explore service establishment, which is would move us potentially on to step two. So without further ado, I do want to introduce Alan of Nielsen um, Strategies. 
Alan is, is an authority on uh, local government services and delivery, and he has extensive knowledge on regional park services. So very happy to have him on, on board. Thanks, Alan. Welcome, Alan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, hello, directors. Nice to see everybody again. It's a pleasure to be here with, with Mark to talk about the background study, to give a bit of an overview of the study, to share some of the findings, and then to also look a little bit at the service framework for a proposed regional park service for the Comox Valley Regional District. When we think about the purpose of the study, it really was put together as a research piece that, in simple terms, looks at what regional parks are, why regional park services get established, who's doing what, and what can we learn from them, and what a regional park service in the Comox Valley could look like. So in all, it's really was designed to help local governments, that is the local governments of the Comox Valley Regional District, so the regional board for the electoral areas and the three municipalities, to make informed decisions on the service, not necessarily on whether there should be a service, that's something that that the local governments will decide for themselves, but then if there is a service, what should that look like? And so advice on the design of a service framework and the different elements that comprise that framework was also central to the regional parks background study. The study looks at, it's broken into a number of different chapters and near the beginning it introduces and defines what regional parks are and it talks about the key characteristics and it sets out to distinguish regional parks from other types of parks that we see. You'll notice from the report there's a park spectrum there which looks at local parks, regional parks, provincial parks and national parks and it talks about regional parks as being those which tend to be focused on protecting nature and regionally significant ecosystems, connecting people to nature through some kind of access to nature in very low impact ways, being active in nature, whether it's through hiking, horseback riding, bike riding on greenways and so forth. And then finally connecting parks and places and in particular through regional greenways. Some of those can be environmental or ecological in nature. So they are greenways for, uh, for wildlife and for flora and fauna, whereas others can be more for individuals, for people to, to use. Some of the benefits and reasons to create regional parks are also identified in the study. We talk about the sustainable growth as a key benefit, and that's laid out in, of course, the regional growth strategy of this regional district and how it talks about the desire for compact communities and also for protection of natural areas. We talk about ecosystem services as a benefit and a reason to create and how we can enhance those services, whether they be on, on purifying air or water or what have you. We talk about protecting biodiversity, the improved physical and mental health. Some of you may know, uh, directors, that, that in recent, you've probably heard in recent weeks, in fact, the um, Parks Canada has extended its program where it started to license mental health professionals to actually prescribe parks uh, access, free access to folks who are stuff who, who need mental health uh, assistance. So that is something that really speaks to the benefit of the mental health benefits of, of these types of nature focused parks. Social connection, um, how to get people into, into parks as well. Cultural recognition, we're starting to see more of an emphasis on cultural recognition, particularly as it relates to First Nations culture. And then economic development and tourism destinations as well. These, these parks do tend to be where they are created somewhat destination parks for folks who are interested in coming to an area to explore to explore and to really experience the nature. The history of the regional parks in the Comox Valley is also reviewed. I won't spend time on that because Mark's already covered that other than to say it goes right back to 1971. And we saw the, some, some acquisitions of lands, Goose Spit, Mount Jeffrey on Hornby Island, Seal Bay or a portion of that at least. Um, 92, we saw a vision come forward for an expanded system. 98, unfortunately, the service became dormant, but then we've picked it up again since. And Mark talked about in 2008, we had the Nature's Trust or, or Nature Without Borders from the Conservation Society. Today, um, or then we had, of course, a number of plans in the interim period for between 2008 and present, both at the electoral area level and through the regional district, but also within the municipalities focused on the desire for more nature protection through parks or using parks. Today, we have 
different local systems that are in place, local parks and greenways throughout the Comox Valley. Each local government, including the electoral areas, has one. And in fact, in Area A, we have three different services. We've got 621, which is the broader service for the electoral areas. We've then got separate services for Hornby and Denman as well. Suffice to say that when we look at at, uh, at the other um, at the existing services in, in the Comox Valley, we we there's a, a tremendous amount going on. We look in the report at the investments that have been made and what's in place. We look at uh, the plans and the strategies also that are in place for expansion because all of the local governments have those plans in place. And we look then also too at some gaps and we talk about the need for collective action through some kind of regional service. And there is this shared sense, Mark talked earlier about the working group and, and as part of this study, not only working with the working group, but also the CIOs and doing some interviews of staff in the individual places and hearing from them kind of what their councils and their populations are talking about. And that is the, this shared sense of, <clears throat> excuse me, of a broader regional system to address a number of different elements, growth pressures in the area, um, crowded destination parks such as Cumberland Lake Park, but many others throughout the area as well. Increased demand. We know when we look around the area, not just COVID related, but certainly kind of punctuated by COVID, if you will, or enhanced by COVID, we see a tremendous increase in the demand for outdoor space and that connection to nature. Perceived inequities as well, this idea that Every, Jeff, every different jurisdiction talks about the investments that they have made specifically into these types of parks with regional characteristics. And no one jurisdiction stands out as being without those thoughts. The importance of greenways is also captured. The background study looks as well, it is a comparative study because we wanted to find out who's doing what in other places and what we can learn from those places. So a number of different services are ex examined. Six services in particular from high growth areas, three on Vancouver Island, the Capital Regional District, the Cowichan Valley Regional District, and Nanaimo Regional District, two in the Lower Mainland, Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley, and then one in the Okanagan, where I am, uh, the Central Okanagan, and that is a picture actually of the Mission Creek Greenway, which I tend to use uh, about weekly, so there is a personal connection there as well, of course. Um, for each of the other systems, we look at population served, we look at the jurisdictions participating in their service areas, we look at the service definition, that is what exactly the service sets out to do. We look at the mandate and scope, so what's included and what isn't included. We look at the system size and the diversity of that system, the governance model that's in place, how the service is delivered, the funding model that's in place. Um, we talk about the acquisition of lands and how each of these is guided by a strategy. We look at the taxes on a typical residence in other regional districts, and we find in these six high growth areas, the taxes on a typical residence run from $45 to $96 per year. We look at uh, strategies for growth and we look at challenges. Observations uh, kind of drawn from the comparative research. Um, one is that the primary focus of all of these other regional park systems is ecosystem protection and access to nature. So that focus we see right across the board. We see the greenways are a feature of all. We see that cultural heritage, as I noted, is becoming more important, particularly as it relates to First Nations culture. Strong demand and growing. And we also see full participation uh, of all regional, of all regional uh, district jurisdictions. Um, within each regional district in the service. So, and that's important because we see three of those different regional districts that we've profiled all have islands and those islands are all, are all participants as well. Um, funding for acquisitions, an important finding from, those, from the comparative research is that funding is safeguarded. We look at acquisition methods, and so there's a variety of those from direct purchase to, to land transfers, to collaborative purchases or to uh, rights of way and so forth. And then we also notice that that each within each of these different regional park systems, each local jurisdiction also has parks which do have, for historical reasons, mostly regional characteristics. So we see an evolution of these services over time. Well, they all started at kind of a local level and then got to a point where it was found that collective action was more effective at creating uh, these, uh, these robust systems. Importantly, we talk about the uh, framework for a Comox Valley Regional Park Service. So we spend a fair bit of time in the report and in a subsequent document looking at the building blocks, 
that uh, tend to be kind of features of every regional shared service. And those are definition and scope, participation, governance, and funding. And you'll note in your package, Madam Chair, that there is a draft uh, or there is a working group. I, let me back up for a second. The draft study was presented to the working group and to the CAOs and coming out of those meetings, um, there was uh, some refinement of recommendations and a service framework was created. And that document is in your package. And the framework document captures and speaks to those four different key elements. Service definition, it talks about the protection and perpetuity of regional, regionally significant natural areas. That's the primary focus of the proposed service. Um, where compatible with that primary focus, the idea would be that the proposed service would provide opportunities for people to access and connect with and enjoy nature. There would also be a secondary purpose or an additional purpose to, this, to the service, and that would be to provide regional greenways, which would exist as off-road linear parks with multi-use trails. And those would connect to local government greenways and active transportation corridors. So there would be this sense of trying to connect everybody and every jurisdiction in the region. Service participation, we have suggested in the proposed framework or the framework for the proposed service that all jurisdictions of the regional district and all parts of every jurisdiction would be included in the service. And that inclusion, that broad inclusion, that total inclusion recognizes really the broad public benefit of regional parks. And it's also, as I noted, a feature in all of the other systems that we looked at in the high growth areas. Service governance, this was a particular element that we spent a fair bit of time on with the working group and with the CAOs. And that's because what we heard from jurisdictions was some concern over control as it relates to important spending decisions, acquisitions and budgets. It's particularly important in the context of a regional park service because the regional park service is one of only a handful of services, I believe there are four, that under the municipal or under I beg your pardon, under the local government act, um, once a jurisdiction chooses to join a regional park service, a jurisdiction cannot leave the service. So this service along with three others is identified in the, in the local government act as one that uh, is not are, are the one to which the withdrawal mechanisms in the uh, in the act do not apply. The services can be reviewed and any jurisdiction can trigger a review under the act, but the services cannot withdraw from the act once they're in there. So this, this notion of governance then and how decisions are made around funding becomes particularly important for many jurisdictions. And we see that here in our own regional district. So what we suggested then to address those concerns and to build a very robust system where spending decisions have broad support of jurisdictions. We suggested a particular governance model that would feature a regional park services committee um, that would provide recommendations to the board on all matters. This committee would have a specialized membership and it would have a specialized supermajority voting mechanism at the committee level. There would be nine members, and this is all proposed, of course, in the, in the framework. Uh, there would be nine members, one member from each, for each, um, for, uh, for, for each 10,000 person population. So that would break down. Courtney would have three members, Comox two, and all other jurisdictions, including the three electoral areas, would each have one. A two thirds majority would be required on all matters, including acquisition and budget, but for the sake of simplicity, all matters. And so all recommendations that were determined by the committee then would require six out of nine votes in order to go through. And we've stated in the document, and this is very important for, uh, for elected officials to understand, for local governments to understand, because we've noted in there that the Local Government Act does not give the board the, the ability to change the voting structure on financial decisions, including uh, acquisition and budgets. And so that means that the actual ultimate decisions taken by the board, based, we hope, on committee recommendations, but taken by the board, are done in accordance with the corporate weighted voting rules of the Local Government Act. So that means that while we can have a customized system at the committee level, we can't extend that system to the board. So what we've said is that in order to ensure that the board understands the importance of this framework and the importance of those committees and the broad support that those committee uh, recommendations receive, we would want to have 
uh, in place a bylaw. We don't need a bylaw typically for committees, but we would want to create a bylaw to set out very clearly why this structure is being put in place and to have a signal from each of the jurisdictions in accepting that bylaw around this table that um, that, that was understood and that there would, we hope then, be good faith on the board going forward and they would accept the recommendations uh, of the committee going forward. Service funding is the fourth and final def, uh, element of the service framework, Madam Chair, and we've noted in there a, a gradual increase in service funding would be anticipated beginning with a very modest initial amount of $275,000. It's outlined in the, in the service framework document as to what those monies would be used for. Key amongst uses in the first year would be strategic planning for the service and the development of a land acquisition strategy. The $275,000 in Sally translates into a little less than $6 for representative residents. And we would expect that to increase incrementally, uh, but that would be determined by committee recommendation and ultimately by the board. So that would be a function, or that would be a decision by the, the members of the service. Any increases it's anticipated would be informed by the Regional Park Strategic Plan and the land acquisition strategy. We've noted Comox First Nations. We don't want to presume any involvement by the Comox First Nations, but we want it very clear, of course, as this board does and this committee does, that that, that desire is always there and that willingness to consult and to accommodate and to involve in any way possible is, is on the table, of course. Local governments uh, are, are committed, that should say, I beg your pardon, to consulting and where possible collaborating with, and that would be on the acquisition of lands, the operation of regional parks and trails, and the protection of important ecosystems. And we see this kind of involvement and collaboration with First Nations and other systems. A system that I'm most familiar with is Metro Vancouver system. That was part of the department of my department when I was a, a, a a general manager in, in Metro Vancouver a few years ago. And there we had struck, we had entered into an agreement with the Suela Tooth to manage a park for Metro Vancouver Regional Park Service. And that was very important for cultural recognition and also for protection of important ecosystems. Um, next steps, finally, uh, Madam Chair, this we're here right now, the feedback, the local government's providing input to the study to, and to the framework, which I've just outlined. And that will be taken then by staff at CVRD for inclusion in a report to the board to explore possible service establishment. If the service then is supported by the board, um, through the service bylaw establishment process, each local government will be asked to provide a letter of support to become a participant in the service. And if the service were then adopted by the board, the service would be funded in the 2023 to 2027 financial plan. And the idea is that once that funding were in place, that the strategic planning and the land acquisition strategy would begin. And I'll pause there. I'll end there, actually, Madam Chair, and uh, invite any questions. Great. I'm sure there's going to be many. So, Director Arbor. Thanks. Uh, really good piece of work all around. Um, and I was I read through the report. I, I I think I agreed with all the different recommendations, uh, including the portioning. To I think you didn't mention that in your presentation, but that the portioning be based on a combination of assessment and population. I think I'd be in favor of that. Um, I think every jurisdiction is gonna have to think a little bit. Um, about what it means to them. I, I, I know that Hornby and Denman would be included in, in the service, or that's the recommendation. So um, I'm sure later on there would be more detailed numbers around how it all, all pans out. Um, our current park service um, has worked pretty good in the rural areas, even though I think the cost centers are all outside of area A. So I look at our three big parks with uh, Seal Bay and Nymph Falls and Goosebit, and they're all kind of outside of, you know, we don't have a big part. I push hard at the board to do a regional park study. And partly it's because there's huge opportunities in our strategic plan in the rural areas that are just hard to achieve. So if I look at the Trent River, the Sable River, <laughs> You know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity down south that is undeveloped and we're going to have a lot of development. So 
and that's going to be benefit the whole region. So if we don't line up some more parks down there, um, we're all going to lose out. The one thing that's been in the back of my mind is um, how to put it. I'll just say it. Yeah, it, you know, we're about to embark on a watershed protection or watershed conservation feasibility as well. Did we pass that to the board? I think. Okay. Yeah, the board, uh, the watershed <laughs> conservation. I think we passed it. <laughs> Looking around, the staff know if we passed it that we're moving forward with it. Oh uh, yeah, Mark. Yeah, we are. We we are we are moving on that, right? But let's just have Mark uh, clarify yeah. what work we're doing. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so we're through the CA on through the chair. So we are doing a study work right now on a watershed stewardship service. So all of the background on what that could look like and um, bringing that back to the EASC um, in a couple of months. Okay, great. Great, so the timing is pretty good on receiving that report because some of the questions I ask myself is, um, and we did talk about that when we had the discussion at the board around the regional park service, which was to think a little bit outside the boundaries of parks too, because most of our nature is in private forest lands, bound by private forest lands in our region. And I have wondered if we should look at other vehicles like community forests or for us to take a stake in this. And um, definitely in area A, a lot of the larger parks would need either a purchase or collaboration with private forest land companies. So whether it's an active management or a more traditional park management to me is uh, a remind, remaining question, but I'm sure that the technical committee that would look at all that would probably take that into consideration. But that's nice, actually, if we get in the next two or three months, that can feed as part of the, uh, the, the, the regional discussions around this. And I did, I did read the whole document, and I, in fact, this morning I was in touch with a colleague at the Naimo RD, one of the counselors, and we were talking about how it works for them. And um, yeah, I think it's the models you brought forward to compare with were good and show how it would, how it could work in the Comox Valley. Um, their low requisition is a bit of a teaser because I don't think we would stay at two hundred fifty thousand because then we would achieve nothing. <laughs> so the question around, again, each jurisdiction is probably going to clamor to understand what the uh, tax impact and benefit is a little more clearly. And I know there was initial discussion around which existing parks might be part of the service, and that was not covered in the report. So I don't think, I think initially we had talked about you know, some of those parks, which ones would go regional and what's the operations and all that. I guess that would be part of the strategic planning. So you're kicking it down the road. So a lot of stuff gets tried to get us into the into the vehicle and then and then try to do the work. Um, but I think in terms of presentation to for rural areas and for the municipalities, sounds really good. I think um, hopefully Comox, Courtney, Cumberland, see the... Uh, James doesn't like the report he's on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hopefully, we we um, you know we can uh, we can all come around. So, in terms of next steps, if we approve this, I suppose you're probably doing the tour, going to the other municipalities to present right now. And so, we would have an update maybe next month or next couple of months. The last question that's also not addressed is how you propose the service establishments because I didn't hear we're going to put this on the municipal ballot in October. Through that, so what what is the uh, the SN process? Unless I missed it, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, the SN process doesn't it can simply be a, a, a sent on behalf of the electors for this service. Correct. Yeah. Um, Ellen, did you want to maybe speak to the the question um, about? parks management, like the current regional parks that we manage, mm -hmm. um, how would that fit in this future service? Um, or when would it fit? Or is that going to be kept separate with um, Seal Bay, Nymph Falls, you know, the goose bit? Sure. Um, yeah. So, did you want me to? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it, it's a very good question. And, it's, and, and maybe I can approach it in this way. Every regional district, because there's a couple of questions that, that Director Arbor asked or, or Comments he made that are, I think, 
really important to, to highlight. Um, one is that is that when we look at the amount of money that goes into something and the initial amount and how that could evolve, every regional one of the one of the interesting things when we look at those other other electoral areas or I beg your pardon those other regional districts and Nanaimo is a classic example of this is how each of these services kind of started very small and then grew over time as support gelled around them and as they realized kind of how effective this vehicle could be for protecting different areas and for acquiring different areas. So Nanaimo actually started um, and for many years was just an electoral area service. And then uh, and, and then we kind of had the municipalities participate only in acquisition. And then we had finally the municipalities say, you know what, this is really a public good type service and it's important for us all to be in on this. And so it then evolved to the point where they were able to have a full regional service. And there's a similar story in those other regional districts as well. But then with respect to the existing um, parks that have regional attributes, it's a really good question because that's something that we see in every other service as well. And I know when I was in Metro Vancouver and we did a big review of our regional park service, we had a number of municipalities say, hey, we've got this park here in you know, everything from Stanley Park to Burnaby Mountain to whatever, we've got these parks. And these really are parks that benefit the entire area and we're kind of paying for them all. So shouldn't they be part of this regional system? And there's a legitimate point there to be made. Some of these parks definitely are very much regional parks. The problem that we had was when we started to pull that thread, it just kept coming and coming and coming and it never ended because every jurisdiction could point to one or two parks. And we'll see that, I suspect, when we have this discussion in the Comox Valley, we'll see the same kind of thing. We've got the Northeast Woods in Comox. We've got in Area B. We've got, um, we've got uh, of course, Seal Bay and Goose Bid. We've got Cumberland uh, Lake. We've got all these other parks that are going, and then Courtney's got a few too, the, the marshes and Courtney. So, so there's going to be all these different things that, that come forward. And each of those on its own is legitimate. And maybe the collective then says, let's take them all and put them in a regional system, um, whole as bolus as it were. And so we kind of, everybody, everybody kind of gets to transfer some of their responsibilities to the region because they're regional parks. They're de facto regional parks. One of the things I suspect you'll find though, is that and maybe the municipalities will be more sensitive about this than the electoral areas, we'll start to see concerns about, well, when we said we want to transfer those, we just mean the payment. We still want governance over them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's certainly what we found in Metro Vancouver, and that's what they found in other places. And so when you look around British Columbia and Kelowna, where I am, you see a number of city parks that really are regional parks but the city has made the decision, no, no, while we would love everybody to pay for this, we want control over what happens in this park because that's important to us. So I think to make a long, to answer kind of in a very long-winded way the question, Madam Chair, um, those kinds of decisions definitely need to kind of come a little further down the line because I suspect if you start to have them now at the outset, you'll never get in the vehicle to use Director Arbor's terms. And I think that what we have found through discussions with the working group, through a review of all the documentation, not only from the CVRD for the electoral areas, but from all the jurisdictions, is that there's a desire to do something to protect nature more. This is one vehicle. Watershed management is certainly another, but this is one vehicle that has been proven to work in many other places. And, and to Director Arbor's point, um, you know, the clock's ticking. And, and if we don't kind of move on this fairly soon, we're going to lose a lot more opportunities. Sure. Dr. Creed? Yeah. Thanks um, to the chair and CEO. Thanks, Alan. Um, glad to see you in this role. A lot friendlier. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're moving in the right direction here. Um, I found out about this regional park service from Peter Crawford, who used to work for the regional district and then work for years in the city of Courtney. And uh, met him on the street one time. He said, why don't you resurrect that service? I said, what service? So I didn't even know it was put on, put to sleep on mothballs there for all these years. And then uh, we, we sort of brought it forward and it, it's gained a little momentum. Um, obviously, you know, the real property of interest is way beyond the scope of just the electoral areas. 
to purchase unless it's bequeathed to us or um, some other act of nature happens that we can get it. It's just beyond our reach. Um, I think uh, obviously at the very beginning of this service, it's just basically covering all the paperwork, you know, for the first year or so. And that, that kind of scares me because I see some of the big opportunities slipping away. And you mentioned that as well. So correct me if I'm wrong, but, but, on the onset, we don't want to be duplicating what we've already got, right? So this would be more around not so much uh, uh, operations and maintenance, but on actual park procurement on new parks that aren't uh, currently uh, owned by the CVRD or, or the, the municipalities, correct? So I think that brings a little bit, because then it's all brand new on the table. And as time goes by, perhaps, you know, they'll say, well, maybe we should do this and maybe we can join that. But my question is around uh, stacking again. Um, there would be nothing, say, to preclude um, having partners like, say, Comox First Nation or like the Comox Valley Land Trust or what have you, work with with this service this new service correct so yes thank you through the chair absolutely director grieve that that is uh that would be an ideal case to have the Comox valley land trust have the Comox first nation come to the table and say hey in the same way the local governments can be better together we can collectively be better with more resource with more resources uh, on the table. And, and I think if I may just, just address the other point you raised, Director Grieve, um, the acquisition of new parks. Yes, we did hear uh, two points there, actually. One, we did hear from the individual jurisdictions, at least at the staff level, that um, while it would be great to kind of take over responsibility or transfer responsibility to the region for some parks, what was deemed more important was to say, let's add to the parks. Let's, let's leave the ones that are in place right now as they are, and let's add to that because A, we need to be protecting more, and B, we need to also create other opportunities so that we take a little bit of pressure off some of the existing parks. Yeah, I think when we look around uh, at the other jurisdictions, the other regional districts that we cite in the, in the report, um, you mentioned kind of the focus in the interim or in the, in the immediate term being to um, simply acquire the land and, and kind of like safeguard that, then we can worry about how to manage it and do that later. And that's exactly what we see happening in other jurisdictions. So if you look, whether it's the capital region, central Okanagan, uh, it, um, it, Nanaimo, I believe as well, but I know uh, for certainly uh, the in Metro Vancouver, the CRD and central Okanagan, they will create kind of park reserves or conservation areas that won't be touched from a development perspective in terms of trails and all that kind of stuff. They'll just acquire them so they can hold them and protect them. And then over time, work them into their plans on how to provide access to those sites. So you've, you've really hit on something important there, I think. Well, precisely, because I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole motivation behind a, a regional system is to be able to, like I always say at this table, you know, that you, you, What's the old saying that a man only gets to buy the, the farm next to his once in his lifetime? Well, sometimes these things only come up once in our lifetime. And if they're gone, they may be gone, not just for a, a, another lifetime, they may be gone forever. So I, I do applaud this. And I certainly hope we can find common ground with the municipalities to move forward on this because uh, uh, you may have a, a good idea of which property I have in mind. And uh, speaking to, uh, you know, to um, once in a lifetime opportunities. I, I think that uh, that this would be good for the community as a whole, good for the, the social fabric of the community, uh, good for partnerships. And, um, you know, I just bring it on. I think it's a great idea. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Director Grief. Um, just a comment on, you know, the, the, the speed, or I guess the, um, the time it will take to accumulate funds into this service. <laughs> Would this service be able to borrow funds if, for instance, a property did come up and we didn't have enough reserve? Thank you, Madam Chair. Absolutely. Um, and, and in fact, when we look at other places, they do create their own reserves and build those over time, but often it is through borrowing then and paid back over time. If we look at Metro Vancouver, for example, it has borrowed in the past, tries not to, but it does, but other places do 
for a much more for the reasons uh, folks around the table have talked about, and that is to get stuff when it's available. Super. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Director Harper. Thanks. Just one, one little comment of concern, and since we're on the topic, might as well raise it now, and partially because I raised it early on into this process of talking about regional parks. It's going to be hard for me to sign on Hornby and Denman if you know things like Mount Jeffrey are not helped out on the operation front, because otherwise we would literally just be sending money for parks off islands if it's just an acquisition and, and such, and that won't be well received. There could be hybrid models, for example, recognizing that you know in the summer it's a four-hour commute and in the winter it's a couple of hour commute into town. Um, we only contribute 10% of the requisition of other people for the rec commission. So there could be some, some other things, but 100% with the value of assessments on Hornby and Denman, and knowing that there's almost no potential that there will be further meaningful acquisition on Hornby and Denman, they're, they're all very parked out. <laughs> um, I, I might have a hard time signing on the, the, the island portion of the re, to the regional park uh, concept. Doug's got a comment. Uh, thank you. Through the chair, yeah, Dan and Hornby, we talked and discussed them a fair bit, but it's important to remember that um, we often view the parks on Hornby Island as CBRD, Mount Jeffrey, but a large portion of those parks is just a crown land lease, which is renewable every 10 years. So I would argue the opportunity to secure that in the public interest could be lost in the future. So something to keep in consideration as we move forward. What? Um, one thing I also just wanted to thank staff is for uh, including greenways in this and not just park acquisition. I know we had tasked Mark um, a while ago with looking at a greenway strategy, and I love the fact that this um, park service has been able to kind of um, join both um, park acquisition and greenways um, because it's still just as important as it was, you know, when we, we uh, tasked Mark with it around getting um, more active transportation routes in the community, um, supporting our, our active transportation um, community to have safe uh, walking and, and riding um, trails. So yeah, super important. I don't see any other comments. So why don't we vote on, on receipt first? Uh, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. We have a recommendation to support the background study. Great. Um, any comments on the recommendation? Green seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Um, we have, let's see, I think we did approve the addendum already, all of the... No, I approved the addendum. I'll second it. Oh, there's no items. That's not there. Okay. There's nothing. There. There's nothing. So we have an in-camera um, recommendation under 91A of the community charter. Moved and seconded. And all in favor? Opposed? Okay. We will move in camera.